Vice Chair is running late this evening as well as the Chair, and therefore the Council has to elect a Chair Pro Tem until one of them arrives uh, the evening. So at this time, I would like to take nominations for Chair Pro Tem. I nominate William Donovan. Is there a second? Second. Any other? All those in favor? Welcome everybody to the June 19, 2019 uh, regular town meeting of the Skyrock Sky Town Council. We'll call the meeting to order uh, and I'll <laughs> ask for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, order 19043, uh, acted on the request from the town clerk to certify the results of the school budget validation referendum election and the special municipal referendum election that was held on Tuesday, June 11, 2019. I'd ask the town clerk to report on this. I presented the certification by the town council of the election results for the school budget validation referendum and the special municipal referendum election that were held Tuesday, June 11. The school budget, uh, question one, school budget validation, which is approved the school budget, the yes vote was 1,814, no's were 644, and blanks were 29. Question two was asking if you want to wish to continue to vote on the school budget for another three years. The yes vote was 1,777, the no vote was 660, the blanks were 50. On the special municipal election in the town council race uh, to fill a vacancy that was um, Created by the resignation of Councillor Baybine uh, with a term to expire in 2020, John Cloutier received 1,252 votes, Jessica Holbrook 1,114, and there were 121 blanks. Question one on the municipal uh, ballot was uh, asking if the school should join the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. The yes vote was 2,133, the no vote was 171, and there were 183 blanks. I submit this for um, certification by the town council. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I have a motion to move this order? So moved. Second. Is there a discussion on the order on the table? Seeing none, all in favor? Wait. Very good. Yes. I was going to say something. She had a question. Oh, please do. Oh, no, I was just going to say that uh, thank you to people who took the time to show up to uh, vote. I know it's hard, or it shouldn't be hard, but people forget that uh, when you have elections that aren't um, rambunctious, shall we say, um, they don't come to vote. And I hope that Scarborough gets back on track for being one of the highest turnout uh, towns in the state in future. Great, thank you. Any further remarks? We'll take that vote again. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. It's unanimous. Uh, order 19-44, swearing in of the newly elected official for the town council, and I would turn that over to the town, town clerk. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I am pleased to state your name. I, John Clucci. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of this state. And of this state. So long as I shall. So long as I shall. Continue as citizen thereof. Continue as citizen thereof. I am pleased to state your name. I, John Clucci. Do swear. Do swear. That I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully discharge. To the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. The duties incumbent upon me. The duties incumbent upon me. As a member of the town council. As a member of the town council. According to the constitution and the laws of the state. According to the constitution and the laws of the state. And the charter of the town of Scarborough. And the charter of the town of Scarborough. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yay. Item number three. We have a slightly revised motion that we'd like you to consider. 
for, for roll call? No, for this item. Good, okay, very good. Item three, roll call. Councilor Cloutier? Here. Councilor Johnson? Present. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hyoma? Here. Vice, uh, Pro Chair, you're catching me off guard. <laughs> I was <laughs> testing you on this one. <laughs> I am present. Uh, uh, order uh, 19045. Do uh, you want me to read a bonafide? No, the order is, will be read as First. presented. Very yeah. good. And then, and Act, the the, yeah. Act on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title 36 of the MRSA, Section 3841, Subsection 2, for the purposes of deliberating two hardship poverty tax abatement cases. Cases numbers 2019-02 and 2019-03, and I'd look to the town manager to introduce this. Yes, this matter, uh, these are, are confidential by statute, so uh, it's appropriate and, in fact, required that you do this uh, in confidential setting. Uh, we do expect, uh, we, we'd like to provide for the event that you would take action on these actions uh, this evening. They are time sensitive, and I believe Councillor Katarina may offer some additional language in that Very regard. Very good. Uh, Councillor Katarina, do you have a motion to amend? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I would amend the, let's just hold on one second because I just got this for the purpose of blurring. Um, I would add after uh, case number 201903 add to come back to public session and to take action on the above mentioned hardship poverty tax abatement cases. Very good. Uh, motion to amend, does it have a second? Second. Uh, discussion. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, we now have a motion on the floor. Do we, public comment, any further public comment on this matter? Discussion. Ready to vote, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. We are in executive session. We do expect to return properly at six to begin the public workshop. How does this work?
the uh, June 19th, 2019 regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Uh, and uh, the item that we uh, went into executive session was order 19-045, uh, uh, which was a two hardship poverty tax abatement cases. And we are now ready to move uh, on, the, on action on both of those items. Councilor Caterina. Uh, yes, I would move uh, approval of the grant abatement on the amount of $940.57 pursuant to Title 36 of MRSA Section 3841 Sub 2 for action on hardship poverty tax abatement case number 2019-02. We have a second. Second. Do we accept public comment on these? I don't believe so. No, there will be no public comment. Uh, there's also a limited uh, uh, council right. deliberation because of the executive uh, uh, nature of the discussion. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you, everyone. That's unanimous. Uh, we are now at item four of the agenda. Um, Mr. Chair, we have one oh, more. Oh, two. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would move approval to grant abatement in the amount of $1,679.81 pursuant to Title 36 of the MRSA uh, Section 3841 Sub 2 for action on hardship poverty tax abatement case number 2019-03. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you. Item four, workshop on growth, and we'll take our seats uh, yes. in front of us. Perfect. So, if anybody okay. needs one, mm -hmm. shall I start? Mm -hmm. It's not by design. Shall I provide some introduction? Please. Please. Okay. Um, I guess we view this as certainly the initial discussion. We expect there to be uh, multiple discussions around this topic. It is very meaty at the end when you get into the details of the uh, growth management strategies that we have in place and associated impact fees potentially. Um, but through the course of the last year or so, I think we've all been feeling and hearing some concern around growth. And, and uh, part of that might be due to the conversation around comp plan. Uh, also this spring, I think um, a, a bit of a revelation around school enrollment issues have come up. And so we really wanted to be proactive and start the conversation. So tonight we'd like to do just that. Uh, Karen and Jay will be collaborating. So first, we'll provide some regional context about how Scarborough stacks up to kind of our, our competitors or neighbors, if you will. Uh, we'd like to get into some details of the growth management ordinance and actually uh, historical performance uh, with the growth uh, annual growth permits and so on and so forth. Um, talk about some trends in single family and multifamily, and then really take a, a, a very specific look at the school enrollment pressures, particularly the incoming kindergarten class. And we've had the ability uh, to really do some detailed analysis and be able to define what that is. So that's the quick agenda. At the end of it, what we'd like to do is leave enough time, certainly to answer your questions. We may not have answers tonight, but that will help inform what the next conversation will be. And some of those questions may require some time for analysis. Um, I think we're open to have questions as we go. And sure. We Karen and I sort of ran through our, our, our dry run. It took us about 15 minutes, so we can either run all the way through or we can stop and do questions, as Tom just said. So at, at, see we'll see goes. what happens. Because Tom threatened us if we took any longer than 20 minutes. <laughs> we got it down to five. I'm not sure if I agree with that. <laughs> Strongly <laughs> encouraged. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, oh, do you want me to Jay. click for you? Sure. All right. 
Um, <laughs> so we did want to put um, the growth that we've seen um, in Scarborough um, in a regional context. And the best way for us to do that was really to look to um, the federal sources um, of uh, population estimates and uh, demographic analysis. And so uh, the numbers that we're going to look at just for the first few slides are really from uh, the Bureau of Census. They put out population estimates in a couple of different series. We're looking at the one-year series right now. They were just released um, for 2018 um, about two, three weeks ago. So these are uh, fresh off the presses, so to speak, um, at the Census Bureau. So the current population, it's mid-year 2018 is the latest that's available. Um, we're 20,352. Um, and that is, um, I still would say, I think that's a conservative number, um, given some of the things that we've seen that I think we'll go over with toward the end of this uh, presentation to talk about um, what we see happening locally. But again, we're looking at about just over 20,000. Um, between now 2010 and 2018, we've added about 1,400 people to the town. Um, to put that in the state's context, uh, Westbrook added slightly more. I think they're uh, maybe 10 or so more than us. And then uh, Scarborough, in terms of the total number of new, of new residents um, living in the town. And you can see, you know, just historically, we've certainly had uh, periods of high growth. And, um, you know, we're large enough now that some of those numbers, when you look at rates of growth, are, are starting to come down. But it still means we have um, a really fairly significant change in population. So this next slide is really looking at um, the growth rates of the other communities. What I did is I pulled the top piece is the um, population growth rate for the same period for Cumberland County as a whole. And then I pulled all the communities that were growing at a faster rate than Scarborough. So we're right at just under 8%. Um, Gorham, about the same. Freeport, Westbrook, Wyndham, Falmouth, and Cumberland is uh, um, in the last few years have really come uh, around. So that that's sort of a new um, community that's really getting hit with some uh, really rapid growth rates. Just to be clear, all of these communities have less total population than Scarborough, uh, but they are growing at a faster rate. And those in are the, the only community. communities that exceed our growth rate? In Cumberland County, and that's probably true, actually, since we have the highest growth rates. You know, um, yeah, so there may be a couple of towns in York County that might have a faster rate of growth. How many towns does that leave us that we're growing faster So what, there are 26 towns in, okay. 27 in Cumberland? Cumberland. Yeah. I don't know. I, I lost count so with Fry Island. And, so there's 20 that are growing yeah. at a slower rate? Yep. 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 Um, and then the next thing we want to look at now, just, just make note, I'm stepping down from 2018 and looking at 2017, and that's because the 2018 numbers don't come with any breakdown right now. There's no um, socioeconomic uh, data available. So what I tried to do is take a look at, um, you know, really some changes in uh, households in terms of of households with the, with children under 18. So what we found is in the rental occupied units, and again, just so you know, rental occupied units can have some single family in there. There's probably about three or 400 units, single family units in Scarborough that are actually rented as opposed to, to owned. Um, and then, so with that rental population, what we have seen is in 2010, of the total rental units, about 32% of those units had children under 18. <coughs> By 2018 or 2017, that number has dropped to 22%. So, right now or 2017, 22% of the multi uh, of the rental units have children under 17. So, for single family, that number really didn't change. It's within a you know, a couple of percentage points, probably the margin of error, basically. So we're still seeing um, about the same percentage of single family, mm. uh, sorry, owner-occupied units um, with children under 18. And then just so you, so you can keep the context of 
households versus total units. If you look at all units in Scarborough, which would include some uh, seasonal units as well as um, units that are in transition that are just vacant, um, either because they've been sold and haven't been occupied, you know, those types of things. What you're looking at is about 29% of all housing units in Scarborough have children under 17, under 18. The next slide really takes a look. Can I ask you? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Is, is this okay that oh, I interrupt you? Of course. Absolutely. Okay. We're at 87% total down that left hand column. Is that, are you saying the other, the, the other 13% of the units are? In the margin of error, of, in that? oh n no, the 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 twelve or thirteen percent. Those are those are vacant units. Okay. Like the town has about five to six hundred units that are held for seasonal use. Um, so that's not counted in um, this twenty two percent or the thirty six percent. That's why I did the twenty nine percent. So you did not. The, these numbers aren't going to equate to a hundred. Is it? Is that yeah that's yep, yep. right these aren't going to equate to 100 because really what the the first line the 22 percent is renter occupied with um, children under 18 rental so they're okay. the, yeah so um, these aren't okay it's all correct right. yes you're right yeah you're right yep sorry yep. About that. thank that's you that's okay yep the last that's one's the yep. 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 yeah 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 um so, and then we were trying to look at, again, a regional context, and what we wanted to do is look at some of these age groups in the context of what's our pull from, the, from Cumberland County. So our total population is um, about 7% of total population um, of the county lives in Scarborough. For that age group of under 5, we're under that, so about 5%. Are living in Scarborough. As you go up in years, you see the percentage of the total children in that age group for the county that are living in Scarborough increases. Now, there's probably a number of reasons for that. I'm going to pick the most obvious, and our, our uh, folks who understand real estate can probably help out with that. Um, Scarborough may not be your, your first home that you're buying. It's probably your second home simply because of the um, pricing of housing right now. And so when you're, and I, I think that may account for some of that lower percentage. That was my, that was the first thing yeah. I saw. Okay. I, I think it's an indication that folks will hear from schools. Yeah. 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 And we might start to see that a little bit more as we. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so these are some of the federal sources of info, and now we're trying to sort of ground truth them about what's happening on the ground that we see in permitting. And Jay's going to walk you through um, a couple of different aspects of how we track units in town. So I have, you know, 11 or 12 more slides to work through, and I'm really going to cover a little bit of history of our growth management ordinance, just sort of how we got to having a growth management ordinance. Then I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of residential trends or that difference between single family and multifamily and where the growth is occurring and, and, and when it's been occurring. And then as we talked about, we'll try to touch on, at least at the early cut, what we understand is happening with the incoming kindergarten class and those impacts on the school. And really, we're focused just on that class at this point, but we'll, we'll get through all that. Um, so just, a, a, as I said, a, a little history of our, our, our growth management ordinance. So as Karen showed in earlier slides, we've been a fast-growing town for many decades. And it was really in the mid-late 90s, early 2000s that we saw rapid growth. And so what you're seeing here was from 97 to 2002, roughly 200 units a year were being built. Um, and roughly 90% of those were single family homes. So there was this incredible um, um, growth happening. And really what was being felt at that time and it's discussed was um, really uh, burdens on municipal services and particularly acutely felt at the schools in terms of capacity at the schools. So that led the town to develop our um, growth and services report, which was um, in the early 2000, 2000, I think it was, could be 2001, my date's escaping me, but very early 2000, really identified some of those impacts. And the outgrowth of that growth and services report was our growth management ordinance. So growth management ordinance, see, the, the, the purpose of the growth management ordinance is to pace the, um, 
the rate of housing in, in town. So it's not necessarily to stop it all together or say only so many houses can be built in totality. It's just on a given, in a given year to, to provide a certain pacing. Um, and it, but it recognizes that you know, the town does want to continue to have some res residential growth and, um, and to ensure that there's fairness in the allocation of whatever limited growth there would be. So the ordinance sort of sets forth the pathway to achieve those goals by one, establishing an annual allocation, basically saying we can have 135 uh, new growth permits issued in a given year. It limits that um, any indiv individual development, i.e. think of a subdivision, can't uh, occupy more than 20% of those uh, growth annual allocation growth permits. That's about 27 growth permits when you do them, break it out. Um, and sort of in accordance with our comprehensive plan and the interests of the town, we want to try to direct growth to those areas where we have infrastructure and we're um, trying to uh, maintain the rural character of other areas of town. We limit the amount of growth permits that can be issued in those low growth areas to no more than 50 permits. Um, and so the remainder must be in, in growth areas. Um, but those three bullets I just touched on really function best when you're thinking about single family. And it was recognized that you know there are multifamily uh, developments that are allowed. And so as part of the ordinance development, uh, the, the town created what our reserve pool. And so the reserve pool is uh, really identified to be allocated for special projects, as, as we call them here on the slide. So these are projects that are taking, care, taking advantage of some of our development incentives in our growth areas, providing for affordable housing, or might be approved as part of a contract <coughs> zone. Um, so there's sort of a limited applicability, if you will, and that's really governed by what's stated in the ordinance and then planning board through the development review process will determine whether um, a certain project if it meets one of those criteria, should be eligible. Um, so, um, and we'll talk. Sorry, we'll talk a little bit that more about that in a moment. But yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. to that point, so like the, the bottom piece around mm -hmm. contracts. So, for example, we're going to be talking about fiber stores later this evening. That would be exempt because of because it's contracts. And it's written into their contracts. So I think yeah. the Beacon is really a, a, a great example that's been approved. It is being built. Um, it's written right into their contract zone. That's 288 total units, and we're actually going to see their impact on our, our. Actually, in the next slide, you'll see their impact with that spike that you get a preview of. And one um, thing worth noting: these multifamily uh, developments, just the pace of construction. You know, to build a hundred single-family homes, uh -huh. just practically speaking, takes five, six. You know, we've got some subdivisions that are 12 years in, in, the, in the works, whereas they're going to build 28 or 288 units in 18 months. Uh -huh. Each so, one. Uh, it really puts a strain on that annual allocation. It's so abnormal in that regard that they can't possibly do it, and nor could they possibly pace their development to wait for to the annual that. allocation. So. Uh, they are truly special circumstances. Mm -hmm. And we, when we see with the multifamily, for example, Beacon, you know, there's 24 units under each roof. Um, so it's how do you, you know, you, yeah. you, there's only so much, you know, obviously they're, when they build one of the buildings, they're going to build all those units at once. So um, just a quick pause yeah, here. I'm going to build on the comments that were made. So just to be clear, though, a permit is for a single unit. However, Y'all units are not equal. Correct. I was. I'll touch on that, but I can. I'm happy yeah. to. I might as well address it now. So, so as you just said, so um, the growth management ordinance and the zoning ordinance basically recognize, and it's really stemming from the zoning ordinance, recognize that certain unit types have different impacts. So, what our zoning ordinance says, and the growth management ordinance follows, if you have a, a one bedroom unit that's of a certain size, that counts as a half a unit for density purposes as well as for growth permit purposes. Of course, it's a total unit. It, it, you know, it's one unit, but it counts as half. If you have a two bedroom that's under a certain size threshold, that's two thirds of a unit. Um, and so you'll, when I get into a, a later slide, there's um, a development, um, uh, South Village and Eastern Village. There's 53 units in there, but they only had to pull 26 and a half growth permits because they're all one bedroom under that size threshold. 
Um, and we'll, we'll start to see that difference. I have a chart that sort of shows that, that differential there. I think that's particularly helpful as we have conversations with people in the community because folks, you know, automatically they see a number, number and yes. go off to the yeah. races. They see 300 and, and they right. Right. automatically assume it's 300. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just to keep it as simple as possible, so the B can use zero permits, correct? Because nope, they, they, they had. Did, they, they, so the contract zone didn't exempt them from those. Yeah, not exempt them. Okay. What it allowed them to do was to pull from the reserve. The reserve. Pool, and then the planning board, as part of their process, said, "Okay, well, yep." And you, do you, you know off the top how many how many permits they had? How many units they were? So there are 288 units they pulled. I do happen to know. Um, so so far they pulled. They, they have building permits for yeah. 240 of the units so far, which accounted for 155 growth permits okay. out of our reserve pool. Um, they still have another 31. 30, thank you, <laughs> 31 to go. Just no. so, so that was 155 out of the pool. Of the reserve pool. Correct. And how many are left in the reserve pool right now? Uh, I'm going to get to that in, okay. in just, <laughs> yep. I told you I was excited. I'm glad we, <laughs> we, an, we anticipated the questions, just didn't anticipate them coming so fast. Yeah. <laughs> really the physics question. Right, right, exactly. Uh, so this slide is just a, a representation of in, in 2005 is when we established the 135 um, uh, 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 annual allocation for growth permits. And so you can see basically from 2000, not basically, from 2005 to 2016, um, through really no effort of the town, we, but we uh, developers weren't pulling growth permits meeting our, our annual allocation. Um, and at this point, none of the reserve pool were being pulled either. But obviously on the right hand side there, 17 and 18, something very different happened. And that th very different thing that happened was anticipated and was talked about very explicitly with this council. And we'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. It's worth noting that, uh, and I don't know the service here, but I've heard from the development community who was very involved, as you might expect, in the whole conversation around growth management. And they were definitely afraid of annual allocation and not being able to build at a pace that the market demanded. Um, and there were a lot of conversations, some negotiation. I don't know exactly how 135 was arrived at. but history suggests that you know, we've never had to turn a permit away. So their fears were never realized, essentially. If we don't use a permit any, in a year, does it carry forward? or is it, it does not. That's forward? actually a change that happened to the growth management ordinance in 2008. They used to carry over. They would roll over and go into the reserve pool. Um, that stopped in 2008, and now they just go away. But the reserve pool now is basically the language was written that, okay, the reserve pool will be governed by the council. And that was a discussion that staff had with council about a, two and a half years ago. And I'll talk about again here in just a, just a moment. It. Replenish it. Yep. To what extent it wishes. And so again, this, this spike we see on the right hand side was a multifamily um, um, uh, interest that we were seeing. And, and I'm gonna talk about that after this next slide. What I just wanted to do before I really talk about the multifamily was, again, sort of put in context, but for sort of this new thing we saw in 2017, the growth, we really saw a slowdown in single family development. So again, I'm harking back to my first slide where from 97 to 02, a six year period, we saw 1,100 single family houses. From 13 to 18, a similar six year period, we saw 417 single family houses. And really, if you take any six year period between 05 and 18, you're gonna to come to roughly this number. You might be a little higher, a little lower, but it's, it's definitely less than half of what was that prior six year period. Jay, how many uh, single family developments are on the table coming up through because I was looking at, at like the planning board agenda for July and this mm -hmm. seems to be a few single family developments that are coming forward for preliminary approval. Yep. Um, so let's see. There's there's um, one down off the Ross Road. There's one off here the Sawyer Road. Mm -hmm. There's one being talked about off the New Road. Um, I would say you know the 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 sub the single family subdivisions have been steady throughout. Okay, so that's nothing unusual. We're, yeah. I'm not. We're, with, we're, with the exception of Layton Farms. Right. Um, most of them are kind of less than twenty. You know, right. All the easy tracks have been developed. 
So you're, well, you're seeing yeah. much smaller but, subdivisions. But I will say that the, the subdivision that's coming forward on Sawyer Road has probably 60 odd. Yes. I, 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 I don't remember the number offhand, I'm sorry, but it's in the order. It it, it's a bigger one. It's a big one. Um, but again, it, seeing a big one every few years like that yeah. sort of makes, you know, it's like, oh, yep, here comes a. I was yeah. just curious so, if it were. Because it was that Sawyer Road when I looked at it. Went, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, that, that's I didn't a bigger one. That was um, that big. But you know that that seems to be trending about consistently. Um, so so that's sort of what we're seeing with single family. Um, but again, we saw that spike, right? So something happened. And as I said, so in conversations that staff started to have with sort of the development community in 2015 and 2016, we we're really starting to see that the market forces were in place for multifamily to come forward and sort of articulate some of the vision we had in, for our zoning. Um, you know, we've updated from our 2006 plan, the long range planning committee working with council, spent a long time really talking about where is it appropriate and ripe for uh, multifamily development and, and sort of did a lot of work with our zoning. So the zoning was in place for all these projects that staff was having conversations with. But then to Tom's earlier point, the concern was, well, how do we build a 36 unit uh, multifamily if we can only get 27 of the annual allocation, right, under one roof? Um, and so that's where, again, as part of those conversations, we recognize that these projects we're talking about largely would um, qualify for the reserve pool. However, those conversations we were having, there was about 750 or so potential units on the table. Now, mind you, in the subsequent years, a few of those projects have fallen off. Um, others have come on. So the number's not quite that high, but that, that was really where, where staff was. And so um, as part of that, in, in late 16, early 17, um, staff had a conversation with council around the reserve pool because the reserve pool at that time was 215 permits. And so there's real discussion around with well, these multifamilies, you know, do one and two bedrooms really have the same impacts as maybe, a, you know, the larger units and or single families. And based on what was forecasted, it was identified that there would probably be minimal impacts on school and municipal services for a host of reasons that were articulated at that time. And we can certainly talk about, but I sort of, because that was, there was quite a lot of discussion two and a half years ago, we can we can sort of do a refresher on that. But um, so anyway, part of that discussion, council said, okay, um, yep, we sort of understand what's happening. Let's up our reserve pool to 500 units. Uh, the other thing I want to say, and I think it's coming back to a question I don't remember who asked, was um, had that I think it was you, John, um, had the growth management ordinance not been revised in 08 to stop that rollover process, there actually would have been 700 growth permits in our reserve pool. Um, so there would have been, so that annual, had we just been hitting the annual allocation all along, we would have been doing more units than growth permits uh, than what our, um, was being talked about. And just a quick one, Jay, Please, to build yeah. on that. So in the rationale for not rolling forward, what was the reasoning for that? I can kind of guess, but what's the... <laughs> Um, boy, I, 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 mean, I, 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 I really would, uh, I, because, I, I don't want to hearken a guess. Because uh, it makes sense to me that you wouldn't carry them forward because the circumstances change and uh, just because they were approved at one point in time, uh, a lot of factors could change, right, yeah. in terms of the economy and a bunch of other things. And, and I mean, again, it's, I'm getting, a, I guess I am, <laughs> one guess might be is, you know, if you get to a, a pool that's 700 units, and if the intent is to sort of pace growth, well, if something comes along and pulls all 700 units in one year, then you could, you know, you're no longer pacing growth. That's a, you know, I think it's, a, it's a logical guess. the ability to replenish or, you know, adjust Absolutely. the circumstances. So. Yep, and so that was what... Okay. Council did in 2017 was they increased it by uh, what's that 285 units right. Right. and is that the only mechanism that the reserve pool is altered at this point through to council. add to it it's through council it's a council right. action that's a, it. Yeah. Yep. Allowed in so the we're at the point now it's just a council action it's yep so okay. it, yep right. so what we've seen so what I say about two and a half years ago it was council up the growth permits to the reserve pool permits to 500 what we've seen to date is 247 and a half reserve pool permits have been issued or committed. That gets to that 
is going to net result 401 units, back to our prior discussion. And you can sort of see the breakout, predominantly one bedroom, a good number of two bedroom, and in a few uh, three bedroom um, are what those reserve pool permits have been issued or committed for. Um, and here you're just sort of seeing that uh, same representation in two, and it, it's two, I'll just say 2017 was the first year we dipped into the reserve pool. So we've only dipped in ever into the reserve pool. Um, three, in really in two years, 2019 we know is coming. It hasn't yet articulated or they haven't pulled those permits yet. But obviously 2017 you can see 190 growth permits were pulled, which are going to materialize in 300 units. What we've seen, what our department, our code department to date has been able to issue occupancy permits for, out of the 401 total units to be created, are 257 multifam new multifamily units are on the market in the last two years. Um, and I can't tell you what exactly the vacancy rate of those are, but in conversations with the developers, we know there people are moving in as we're writing, as the ink is drying on those certificate of occupancies, people are moving in. And they're lease they're pre-leasing up, so um, it's, it's low. I don't know exactly what it is, but um, anyway. Um, well, and part of what's driving that, too, is at least regionally, you know, we've had an incredibly low vacancy rate in um, particularly rental housing and multifamily. So I think you're, you're, you're seeing some spike responding to the regional market demand, not just Scarborough. Um, and then there were also, I think, some, you probably know better than us, that there were some uh, tax code issues that made multifamily start to be somewhat attractive. And so, oop, yeah, so uh, that'd be an interesting metric to track is the difference between permits issued and occupancy permits mm -hmm. um, granted and see how that changes over time, whether it's going up or down. Well, so, so when we issue those, when we issue, when, when the code office, our department issues an occupancy permit, at that point it's then at the, you know, we don't go back and issue occupancies for each individual unit. We say, okay, you can, you can have people move in. But, but so far, we have reached out to the developers yes. to ask them to provide information. They've all been very open, sort of say, oh, yeah, I'm happy to provide. We're still gathering that information, mm -hmm. I think, as Tom talked about. Maybe we can do a deeper dive later on. Um, so, but uh, you have a process for reconciling you yep. know, when they're mm -hmm. closed out or not and how exactly. running total is. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I know this is readily available in the, the uh, growth ordinance, but is there a one sheet for the public to easily equate a permit to a unit? Do we have that mechanism? Right. So you can comb through them, right? But do we have a, something that's available to the public that makes it very easy to understand how an, one permit can equate to? There's oh, a oh, table. Oh, yes. There's yeah. a table in the ordinance, yeah. yes. So, right, so in our performance standards in the ordinance, that, okay. that is... Um, so sections. for communication committee, that might be yep. something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Right. I think what you're really referring to is maybe a one-page primer, mm -hmm. just kind of a... Right, right. The okay. sort of so ratio, the density Correct. ratio. But, yep. That, that, just that so is. everybody's speaking the same language. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. So then so the question no. that you know, talking with Tom and sort of the direction uh, staff was asked to look at was, okay, we sort of have we know this new this multifamily thing is happening, um, and we also know we have a burgeoning kindergarten class, and sort of what's is there a correlation between the two? What what exactly is happening here? And again, I just want to be very clear, we're only talking about the incoming kindergarten class. We aren't talking about any other classes at this point. Um, so what we looked at was of the 231 uh, incoming kindergartners, and this class is significantly bigger than what we've seen historically. Um, it's 70 or 80 kids, as I recall. It's right. in addition to. Yep. Wow. So about 150 last year. So what, what we're seeing based on, we've been, we were able to work with our partners in the school department to try to understand what type of, what type of housing are the children coming from. Um, and so at this point, we know that there are no children, 0% of the incoming kindergarten class are coming from the new multifamily developments. So those 257 units I just talked about, there's zero coming from those. There's a total of the 231, only 4% are coming from pre existing multifamilies. And there are some, are, if you think about the Oaks, you think about Foxcroft, Coach Lantern, right. um, there, there's a number around. So there's only 4% of this 231 are coming from, again, like I said, pre existing multifamily. 
what we found, interestingly, is that a full 50% are coming from, from, from families that have moved into a new home within the last five years. These could be pre-existing homes, homes that are older than five years, or homes that were built within the last five years. But a full half of them have moved in town, whether to town or around town, whatever the case may be, they moved into a new housing. Um, and so what that tells us, as I sort of said, uh, so 8% of the incoming class are children, are coming from families who have moved into new housing stock within the last five years. Only 8% of these kids are go coming from any of the new housing stocks. So that tells us that a full 92% are coming from pre-existing units of some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. So what you're telling us is uh, all of our assumptions are dead wrong. In terms of what, so, what, what we thought. Stock. <laughs> <laughs> what we thought about we would never say that. But. <laughs> so uh, just, just this is my last slide. And then, um, so Sorry, basically, just, no, you know, the no that, but that's, <laughs> you, you, said, you said it for me. Essentially, you know, again, we've only looked at one class. So, you know, we understand there, but what this is really starting to suggest is that really the community is still feeling the impacts of the rapid single family growth over the past decades yes. and not the recent growth. And so we, we start to think, is this really the matter of families who have lived here, you know, in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, maybe aging out of their homes, mm -hmm. selling, yes. and new families moving in to... Um, mm -hmm. So that's that so, you were talking about in 2008 with the 1100 or whatever. That's, that's what you're pointing to. The, the 97 mm -hmm. to, to right. 2000, that's, that's and, that Right, mm -hmm. yep. It's the turnover that's, of the existing yeah, housing right. stock. That's what we're start. That's that's the assumption we're starting to make, rather than right. the assumption of wow, look at all this multifamily right. and that easy correlation between lots of multifamily, lots of kindergartners. Aha! Well, no. <laughs> it's it's not proving out that way. And we would say the the census information, the estimates from the 2017. Granted, it's a um, couple of years out of date now, but what they're saying is that they. They, they mirror some of the, this information. And what they're saying is, in any one year, there's about 2,000 people that have moved into Scarborough. That's not 2,000 growth. That's a change. We call it the churn. Right. You know, people moving out, new, new people moving in. Right. And, um, and we looked at that thinking there was um, a lot of people moving around within, within Scarborough, but we found at least in 2017, only about 50 of those 2,000 were moving from within Scarborough. The rest of them are coming from, from mm -hmm. other places. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a, that's a pretty big churn. That's 10% of our population every year that is new to Scarborough. Mm -hmm. So it, it looks like the... Uh, uh, very substantial growth over a long period of time has caused a lot of people who have owned their houses for a long time to then sell them. And we are now in a trend where there is a turnover. And those homes that are owned by people who were 40 when they bought them, they're now 60 or 70. And they're selling them. That, that's what we're, that's, that's where we think, that, that's where the numbers are leading us more than anywhere else. That's what we, that's what we see too. That's what we're seeing. Yeah. I, I think you'll see a spike in birth rates five years ago as well, and that's contributing. Mm -hmm. We did a take a look. Right. Yeah, we did take a look I at the know. birth rates, and so 2014 had a weird little spike, um, and then it dropped back down. Uh, but yeah, 2014 had a had a spike. You're absolutely right. Yeah, we were but it trying to figure out how much 80. data to provide you with. That's anecdotal. I mean, sure. just what I'm told or when people say, well, I want to move to Scarborough. And they say, well, because the school, you know, mm -hmm. I get into schools conversations. Number one, schools number two. And, and mm -hmm. everything else that we have. That's yeah, that proximity to Portland, yeah. et, et cetera, I have yeah. a question here. So it's, it's not really related to the presentation today, but it's something that I've been turning and burning for two and a half years now. And... It's a, I see it as a challenge and an opportunity, and I have no idea how to, to make it happen. But when we look at that spike, right, like the spike I'd love to see, and I'm sure Jean Marie would love to see it too, is how can we incentivize growth for developers to build us another Magnolia Place or oh, Juneberry? Really? Because that is the kind of development and growth 
that we mm. truly need. The 55 above plus. Any, yes. And it doesn't even have to be 55 right. plus. But single ranch, level. Yeah. Ranch. Ranch. Yeah. Yeah. ranch. Yeah. Yeah. In my three bedroom, I could sell two bath well. ranch with a two car yeah. garage, and I can sell 100 of yeah. them tomorrow. Yeah. Not unique to Scarborough, right? That's mm. the trend. Um, throughout well, the region. It, but it addresses that same yeah. demographic. Right. So those people that mm -hmm. were in those that spike there, yep. and Bill was just referring to, who are now 60 and 70, right. they want to stay here. Yeah. And there's nowhere right. for them there's to, no place to, to go. go. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's it's a real... Would, would those type of... Oh, usually sorry, the no. de development community, if there's an that's opportunity, they say. will usually uh, uh, They will that, tell right? you. I've begged, I've pleaded, <laughs> I've... <laughs> we have. We, we're real estate. We yeah. know. We, I is mean, it build it for the, me, I can sell it. <laughs> is it because of the value it's of the, the land? It's the profit it's margin. It's the cost and right. the profit and the margin. It's profit and, margin. And the cost yeah. to build. Yeah. Easier so to put on a second So they can't sell those homes, the single-story homes like that, for as much as they can, the traditional homes that they're building. So therefore, the market right now... It costs more to build them... Yeah, mm -hmm. for the price they can get because okay. roof moving the ground and foundation mm -hmm. costs more. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so consequently what's happening then is the, the market forces are forcing those uh, values in those neighborhoods to be I mean some of the houses that it's insane what they're going for. <laughs> to be and, honest. And and those people generally want to be able to own yes. a smaller home. Yes. Mm -hmm. As opposed to because we the data says that single family or, or uh, single bedroom, two bedroom units are not a cause of population growth in the schools. So, but they, th this population we're talking about does not want to gravitate into a rental no, unit that is one or two bedrooms. They do not want to pay rent. They haven't been paying a mortgage. Why do they want to pay rent? Yeah. And what they love about those two neighborhoods is the privacy of still have your own home but someone else still cuts the grass and somebody else still takes care of the, the snow and sounds um, good yeah yeah I but, want, they don't I, want, but they don't want condos the ones that, anyway most of them don't yeah. some it's duplexes interesting. it is yeah, interesting. It's interesting but but i here's my opportunity and my challenge mm -hmm. for the <laughs> councils of the future is to figure out a way to incentivize that because i think that would would help uh it would be in one more piece of the puzzle to some of the tax issues that we have. Yes, Karen, you answered my uh, you answered my one of my questions. So thank you about the intertown moving. Because mm -hmm. uh, can you guys define the new multifamily developments? Because there can't be too many of them. So can we define them? As far as I know, there's some heavy hitters. Sure. Can we? Yep. Beacon certainly one of them. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, um, Carrier Woods. Carrier Woods. Um, some of Eastern oh. Village. Eastern Village. When you say some of Eastern Village, it's... Well, because Eastern Village yeah. is... Has single families yeah. and multi The ones that are out back that are... Yeah. We're talking the ones in the Dunstan. last couple of years. Yeah, so. Dun Dunstan has... Uh, Harold Burnham's Burnham built mm -hmm. some down there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, Burnham Woods is included in all that. Yep. Yep. Okay. yep. Who else are we missing? Is all that's good. I was looking for four or five. So okay. that's, that's good. That's just, yeah. The housing, as you come down uh, Black Point Road and look... To the right and see those large structures. Yes. Are they condos or are they apartments? Those are those are the one bedroom apartments. Those are the ones that I talked about. Uh, there's 53 units in there. They require 26 and a half growth permits. So, so those. Village that you mm -hmm. That's so the South Village. village. Yep. Yeah. That's those are still those aren't fully occupied. So I think you know we have right. the opportunity once they get fully occupied to, to take mm -hmm. another temperature and yeah. work with yep. property managers and really understand yeah. you know, what the impacts are from. Likely impacts are for mm. their residents. Our understanding that the new units have been uh, healthy in terms of, of uh, the demand, so yes. people are filling them out, and that makes sense because you've got a lot of older stock units throughout the region, and there was a dearth of, of rental units being built for like 20 years in the entire region, and so all of a sudden we have some really uh, wonderful new units coming online, and those rise to the top. Um, in terms of people's desires. Incidentally, it looks like that window's closed, and we predicted that that would be kind of a flash mm -hmm. in the pan, if you will. Uh, and all of it was predicated on a regional study that identified a deficit of like 4,000 rental right. units in Greater Portland. So everyone clamored into that market. We got our share. Um, you know, uh, the other phase of uh, 
Enterprise Business Park. Um, has gone quiet. They're marketing that as uh, another 250 multi unit. They're not getting anything. Mm. Something like that. Yeah. So yes. it seems as though the market is now kind of contracting, saying, all right, enough's enough. And so we don't expect we're going to see a continued um, mm. interest in multifamily, not to the extent we've seen over the last 24 months. Mm. Yeah. Further. I did want to point out, uh, uh, I see folks in the land trust here, uh, you'll, you'll consider a matter later on your uh, agenda that will actually use the remaining funds in the, in the third and final uh, land bond. Uh, you know, part of the conversation in terms of managing growth is, is also conservation of land. And so that's something that uh, this council may want to at least talk about uh, whether we want to go back to the voters and replenish that fund. So. Uh, they can be able to act when there's opportunities. And that's part of a multifaceted strategy in terms of managing growth, I think, is conserving land at the same time. And I think that sits well with people uh, uh, to support conservation efforts, to preserve land uh, in a community like Scarborough that has a lot of uh, natural land settings and marsh areas. And Given, given the fact that we've gone three times and it has uh, received uh, tremendous support each and every time, I think it's a good indicator of what those attitudes are. Is that funded purely from a bond issuance, or is it? Uh, uh, are there fees that we tack on to new developments to, to help We do have that? a development transfer fee, but it really does not produce much of anything. It's mm -hmm. predominantly uh, bond monies. Okay. And those and usually have been when the Scarborough Land Trust has come to us with a proposal that... Uh, expect to draw some real support for the nature of the property and and fundraising efforts on their part to join in the effort. And we have a very well established thorough vetting process to know, you know, when an investment is, is wise. You know, some benchmark properties that new invest new acquisitions are compared against. Uh, so we can can feel comfortable. I think there's over a thousand acres conserved now. Is that right? And and a couple of years ago, when we really started to draw down uh, the, uh, fu the the bond funds that were available, we made the point that uh, it, uh, it would be great to see um, conservation uh, land, uh, Scarborough Land Trust pay attention to the uh, development of trails and uh, public access. And they in recent years they've really focused a lot of energy on that. What was the last bond issuance for? Uh, it was actually just a million dollars, as I recall, and that was an opportunity through the Community Development Foundation. It was a matching opportunity. Uh, I think that was the third and final. Do you know what year that was? <laughs> I, I don't offhand. Okay. It's certainly, it, it's been done since I've been here, so it was after 2008. Okay. Are there other areas uh, growth related that are of interest to you that we, we've got our own thoughts. Um, we've done some um, graphical work uh, understanding where the gra growth is occurring to make sure that it's actually occurring in the areas that we want. And we're pleasantly pleased that it's really producing the desired result in that, in that regard and we can provide that to you. Um, so we're interested in taking this conversation where you'd like to go. I'd like to say that the uh uh, the detail on the growth permits was really helpful, uh, very enlightening, very insightful. So, and I'd like to ask, you know, to help folks who are tracking this, uh, I think it'd be great if we could post this, you know, just as a matter of course, so that, you know, we can, uh, this would be very helpful for us managing expectations and communicating around the whole topic. Other things that I think we might do, I think would be helpful to know, to know, and I know Larissa's quite good at this as well, trying to identify trends and what are some strategies and tactics that other, you know, similarly situated um, towns are using, you know, not only, you know, in the immediate area, but also the state and maybe even beyond that, you know, what, what do folks look at, what, what sort of things have worked, uh, but I like what we're doing and I like the flexibility around uh, adjusting to deal with uh, changes in market conditions and other factors. Yeah, something else I would add, I'd be interested to see a lot of these multifamily developments are new and shiny, so to speak. So I would like to know what the trend is when these when these properties actually age uh, or let's say the economy takes a downturn. Uh, what is the what is a historical trend for these multi-units? Because I think right now 
they are absolutely attracting a certain demographic, but will that demographic be the same demographic 10 years from now when everything's not either as robust as it is economically or the buildings themselves are not as attractive? We, we, we do you, have information And the beauty of the multifamily is they all have property managers, so there's yeah. someone that has that you know has this data. One one. But I would like to see like what happened. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Track them over one, time. one of the interesting pieces of information that Karen and I have sort of discovered, and this is just from conversation with sort of our cohorts and associates in other towns, is even towns that aren't experiencing the same mm -hmm. level of growth we are, like we are, such as Cape Elizabeth, which is a very low growth, slow growth town, they're experiencing impacts in their school systems as well. So it's you know, there's you know, sort of what's that dynamic? Is it's not just the fast growing towns that are feeling it. Um, and I think that's something we, we're mm -hmm. still sort of exploring and trying to do a deeper mm -hmm. delve, dive into. But I'm sorry. I think you guys did a great job. Um, Thank you. Some things that I would like to see or understand a little mm -hmm. better with the multifamily um, as they complete, what's the inventory rates and which way are rents going and how fast. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, just something to keep a pulse on the pipeline. And then the same thing with the single family. The, the difference between what you've issued for permits versus what's been uh, built out or, or issued a, an occupancy permit. Mm -hmm. um, understanding whether that's going up or down, I think, is helpful when things come before the, the council mm -hmm. for us to, to gauge whether, it, you know, what's the market doing next year, not mm -hmm. what did it do last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess the final point I'd mention, we don't know for sure. We can't look at the, we don't have a crystal ball, but it does appear as though, uh, particularly with, with the downs and depending on their pace of development and how quickly they move on the residential side, uh, there could be upward pressure um, on that annual allocation. And so that's something we're tracking carefully. And uh, we may need to come back to you and have some conversation around that. There are some anomalies uh, related to the, the, the downs that, that are easy fixes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, for instance, we have a 10% inclusionary requirement. Currently, none of those 10% are eligible for the reserve pool. So they're competing against everyone else for the annual allocation. So. That could be a simple fix that would kind of relieve pressure because of that uniqueness. And it was just something we, we didn't catch. Yeah, right. it's interesting. We have other zones that have um, uh, density incentives if you provide affordable housing. And so those developers that are taking advantage of that incentive, they are eligible to go from the reserve pool. The Downs or Crossroads District, as you know, our zoning calls it, is, as Tom said, our only inclusionary zoning. They're required to do affordable housing, yet they're not eligible to pull from the reserve pool. And so I think that's something that we've looked at and said, well, that, that, seems, that seems off. Right. And I think cross <laughs> and, uh, Crossroads was, the zone was created, I think, after we did some of the um, uh, work with growth mm -hmm. management. So I think it was just... Um, not necessarily an oversight, but it was one of those things that I don't think we anticipated developing the crossroads zone the way we did. And so many ten moving years parts ago. that yeah. So yeah. we're tracking that yep. experience very closely. If we sense that we're getting up to a, an issue, we'll try to get it to you in plenty of time so we can have some conversation. Right. right. Council, we appreciate that. Right. Good. We appreciate your attention. We're finished with the work. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you. Oh. Thank you. Take a three minute break before we resume the meeting.
2019 meeting of the uh, uh, Scarborough Town Council. Uh, we just completed a workshop on growth, uh, and we are now on item uh, five of the agenda, which is general public comments. And anyone wishing to comment on anything that is not on the agenda uh, for this evening, please approach the podium, and we'd like to hear from you. Closed public comment. Uh, item six, minutes of June 5, 2019, Town Council meeting. May I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion, changes, or alterations? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you, that's unanimous. Uh, <clears throat> item seven, adjustments to the agenda. There are no adjustments contemplated at this time. Uh, item eight, items to be signed are the treasurer's warrants, and I have those, and I will sign those later in the meeting. Uh, <clears throat> we are now at order 19-42, 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the request to amend Chapter 1016, the Garage Yard Sale Ordinance. And I would look to the Ordinance Committee Chair or the Town Manager. I will do it. Um, yeah, what we're doing here, this, this came about as a result of a nonprofit, particular Alliance Club, up by me <laughs> on 114, who are, they do regular yard sales to raise money for their operations, and they asked us if we could increase permitting, and um, it was, oh, I'm sorry, it was pretty thoroughly vetted um, by the ordinance committee members, so I would, I would uh, encourage us to pass this. Thank you. Any uh, public comment? This is a public hearing uh, and second reading uh, on the uh, uh, ordinance amendment for garage and yard sales. Public comment, please. Anyone wishing to speak, please approach the podium. Uh, I'd like to request somebody move the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion? Pretty well vetted previously. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you, it's unanimous. Uh, order 1946, a 7 p.m. public hearing on the First Amendment to the Bessie School Affordable Housing TIF District and Development Program, and I'd ask the town manager to introduce this item. Yes, I, I wonder, we do have legal counsel here, Shauna Mueller. Um, the next three items are all interrelated, and it may be helpful if she provides just a couple of introductory comments as to how that relates. Is that permissible? Yeah, thank you. Attorney Mueller, good to see you. I just thought I'd ask for a sound check, though. I, I don't know if her microphone is on or not. I'm not sure. Sorry. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> is this better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hamill. Um, so just to back up a little bit, I wanted to make the distinction for, for folks' benefit that there's a difference between an affordable housing tip district and other types of TIF districts that the council has considered before. They're specific to affordable housing, qualified affordable housing projects, and um, are reviewed by the Maine State Housing Authority as opposed to the Department of Economic and Community Development. 
This proposal initially, the first public hearing, is about amending an existing district, affordable housing district, that's been in place since 2006. Um, this project was always contemplated to have two phases, and the second phase is coming imminently, and um, it's been a while it's been since, since 2006, so the um, thought here and the proposal here from the developer was to, rather than um, continue with the existing district for the new project, um, instead, we are a proposed in front of you to re revise or amend the district boundaries of the existing district to remove the area that will be developed as the new project. And what that does is it allows the credit enhancement agreement and TIF district for the new project to last for the full maximum term of years under the TIF statute, which is 30 years. Um, and so that's the reason you've got a kind of structure here where there's initially an amendment to remove portion of the existing district from that district, and then the second public hearing is to establish the new affordable housing district for the new project, and um, we've accomplished um, the decision making or the vote by the council on both of those actions in one council order, council 19-48. Um, the other thing that's relevant just for folks to know is there is a lease agreement between the town and the developer in this um, circumstance. The land for this district is actually owned by the municipality, and there's a, an existing lease agreement that was executed in 2006 that governs that. And I think um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them, or we can move forward with the hearing. Uh, questions for Councilor Mueller at this point? Won't be the last opportunity to ask any, but... Uh, uh, thank you, Shana. Ooh. Public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to address this uh, matter before the town council? Please approach the podium. Just, just to be clear, that's the first, um, each public hearing has to be separate for statutory yeah. purposes. Okay. So it's a formal so public hearing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Public so this, this is a formal public hearing. And we will open the public hearing at this time. And we need to do one for each of the three. Mm -hmm. There's two of them. Yes. Two of them. Yep. Oh. <laughs> we were all excitedly, <laughs> anxiously <laughs> thinking you were heading to the podium. <laughs> Close the public hearing on uh, 1946. Uh, 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 order 1947 is also a public hearing on the proposed new Bessie Commons 2 affordable housing TIF district and adoption of a development program for the new district. Uh, again, uh, any further comments from the, I think uh, Councillor Mueller has teed this one up. So uh, anyone wishing to speak uh, as a part of the public hearing, please approach the podium. Close the public hearing. Order 19-48, act on the request to approve one, the First Amendment to the Bessie School Affordable Housing TIF District and Development Program, and two, the Bessie Commons II Affordable Housing TIF District and adoption of a development program for the new district. Uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to uh, address the council on this order, please approach the podium. Close it. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. So I, I'm building off uh, uh, the co-chair and pro tem's uh, suggestion that there'd be uh, other opportunities to ask questions. But and I know I may be ahead of myself on this that this is only the TIF part of the Bessie too. But in reading through the materials, you know the the volume the voluminous uh, material associated with this. Um, I had questions around what happens at the end of the ownership period. As I'm reading the underlying materials, the, the lease and other factors, you know, this is a 99-year lease, uh, a dollar a year uh, rent, and there are, are also things that go along with that, uh, the tax, you know, there's no tax paid for the period of time um, that the CEA is in effect. Uh, uh, 
However, as I read these, it's pretty clear that the, the those rights and those those things that are provided for through the TIF and the CEA could flow to uh, a new owner uh, or change an entity uh, who uh, uh, may be a private entity. Uh, and as I understand it, those things, the 99-year lease, uh, as well as uh, not paying taxes, um, you know, those benefits could flow potentially to a new owner. So m my question is, is there a way for us at some point to figure out uh, a way that we would be able to continue to get low income senior housing benefits um, in exchange for those things? Because as I understand it, there would be a possibility for a new owner potentially not to continue those things and to be able to still, con still receive those benefits from the town no taxes and uh, a dollar a year uh, lease payment. So, and I, I think I had, sorry for the last minute request, but I've uh, mm -hmm. given a heads up to Tom and also Shana, you know, you saw this on your radar screen, so sorry for the late request. But anyway, I, it's a tough question. I thought I'd ask it early so right. that we have time no, to I that. I appreciate it. Yeah. And Council Mueller, would you address that please? If she takes the podium, really there are two protections and, and perhaps more that she'll mention, but um, one is in the actual text of the, the, the limitations of the, the use of the premises. Mm -hmm. uh, it's limited to senior housing um, only. Right. Um, in terms of the affordability component, uh, so long as the project is through main housing program, the federal tax program, we have great assurance that uh, that is carefully watched and even under um, a, a sale or transfer, uh, those obligations would, would remain so long as that financing is still in place. Right. And those yeah. are for periods, as I understand it, federally for 30 years, State of Maine, 45 years. Uh, that's a long time from now. However, <laughs> correct. <laughs> and maybe some of us will still. There's be some here period of the lease that may run beyond that runs beyond that. And <coughs> so, but the idea, the, the question is that, uh, and this is relatively new, new ground for everyone, right? That it's 2006. We've been running, you know, for only 90 years of the first 30 or whatever, or 45. So we're, we're not far enough along to really know what happens if and when ownership changes and then what, what, would, what we would do or what a future council might do faced with those questions. Yeah, so, so thank you for the questions. Um, one thing just to, to sort of take a step back is that um, the proposal in front of the council tonight is about the affordable housing TIF arrangement only. And so this lease agreement it has been in place, as I said, since 2006. And the terms of that lease agreement weren't really contemplated to be part of the kind of proposal to the council at this stage, just to kind of keep those things um, separate, but still um, relevant. So um, the uh, affordability requirements on the existing project, I'm informed by the developer that actually at the time that that project was developed and constructed, the requirements for main housing were that 90 years be the affordability period. And so um, just to make sure that that's understood, Bessie 1 does have a 90 year, starting from when it was constructed, um, requirement for affordability to, to be maintained um, by the, the financing mechanism. Um, the standards have changed, Main State Housing Authority standards have changed, and so now it's a 45 year term. Um, and so that's, um, that's sort of just the external forces outside of the lease agreement. The lease agreement itself does talk about contemplating um, uh, elderly housing. And so if at any point elderly housing is not the use being made of the property subject to the lease, the um, enforceability provisions and potentially termination of the lease would be an option for the town in an enforcement consideration. Um, in addition to that, um, there is a contemplation in the lease that because the town is going to have this elderly housing, that there wouldn't be property taxes paid um, on the property. The mechanism to allow for that is the tax increment financing arrangement. And so we put that in place, the town put that in place. It was before my time here, but um, in 2006. Of course, the TIF statute only has a 30-year time period maximum term, and so the lease obviously goes out beyond that. Um, if at the end of the TIF term, what happens is the, the use is continued, it is likely that the project owner at that time would convert to an affordable, to a nonprofit entity, no longer being sort 
for having the benefit of the tax credits any longer. So they can could do that because they're they're providing a qualified nonprofit type of um, use and, and operating. So then they would qualify um, under tax law, property tax law, for an exemption. Um, if for some reason they were not to qualify for a property tax exemption, then um, there would not be a legal authorization or, or justification for not assessing property tax to that entity at that time, um, despite the fact that the lease contemplates that there wouldn't be tax paid. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's important for folks to understand. We have constitutional provisions that would trump that requirement or that statement really in the lease that says the proper project would not be subject to tax. Um, there's also a provision in the lease that says to the extent there's a provision that's deemed to be legal, that the rest of the agreement would remain in place and enforceable. And so I, I'm hopeful that that gives you a little bit of comfort as well. It, it does. If I may, uh, if I may uh, Mr. Chairman, ask Please. a follow-up question. Uh, I saw in the in the Bessie 2 Development Plan Narrative 3, Section C, that um, there's language in there that uh, presumes a continued low-income housing use for the term of the 99-year lease uh, through several agreements entered into and funding sources, including an extended low-income use agreement entered into with and supervised by Maine Housing. So the question, I, the question remains, so what happens if it's not, not somebody that's obligated by those things? It's a private private entity, um, those those protections, you know, as I read this, may not continue, yet they would still continue potentially to get benefits of uh, low lease, uh, you know, basically free free rent, a dollar a year, and, um, um, and other things, and not be required to continue to provide low income housing. I'm, I'm, I'm comforted by the fact that the senior housing obligation is in the lease but that's still a gap for me. The other gap is, so if, if not now, when do when would we be talking about renegotiating the lease? I've read the, re the lease very carefully. There are very, there's no ability to change the, as I read it, <laughs> to change the lease, to change the rent in the lease. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, we, we weren't really evaluating the lease and the terms and whether we were gonna um, kind of reopen anything in that document. So, um, and, and I think what you're asking about is at the end of the TIF district term, um, because until that time, there are requirements that they continue to function yep. in the way that would qualify for a TIF. Yep. Um, so, so I guess at that time, we, we would um, have potentially an, a disagreement with them, I don't know, about um, the town's position that the lease was entered into on the assumption that it would be an affordable elderly um, housing opportunity. And, and we could argue about what the intent of the council was at the time in 2006 that they entered into this, the language not being crystal clear that I can point to right at this moment um, to say that, that yeah, it should, it should be affordable as well. Um, but there's certainly lots of things in this lease that point in the direction of um, an understanding this was meant to be an affordable housing project for, for the elderly. Um, and so if the developer, whoever that might be in the future, ends up to doing market rate elderly housing, I think that's where we would end up having a, a discussion or an issue. And, and just so you all uh, know, I think you probably do, but the developer and, and their counsel are here and can also speak to some of these issues also being familiar with that lease agreement. Okay. Yeah, the only, my own question is, so uh, rather than letting someone in the future decide it, is this something that we should attend to now? And if not at this time, then would there be an opportunity for us to do that before the thing is finalized? I realize there's some deadline pressure, and that sort of thing. I don't want to have uh, an effect on that. However, uh, it did seem to me like a pretty big question that, I, that I'm still wrestling with in my, you know, time. Okay. Great. Okay, I think I may um, suggest that we hear from the Developers Council. I know that yes. they want to speak directly to your questions if, and also can speak to the, the timing needs of, of the project directly. Uh, if Attorney Kaminsky could take the podium and provide us a response, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, first of all, in terms of factual background, everything that uh, Attorney Muller has told you folks about the restrictions and so forth for main state housing is fully applicable, and, and we agree with that. There's one other provision in the lease that I think directly addresses your concern, uh, which is the provision in Section 13, which talks about assignment or subletting by the tenant. The tenant right now is Bessie Commons Senior Housing, and if Bessie Commons Senior Housing were ever to uh, attempt to further assign, sublet, or convey its interest in this property, it would need to come back to the town. And the lease says that they need to come back to the town, and they cannot do that without the consent of the town, which consent shall not be unreasonably withheld. Yeah, it's that language that bothers me. And it would seem to me that if the town is taking the position at that point in time that we got a project that was contemplated to be affordable housing, and everyone knew that in 2006, everyone knew that in 2019 when we did this again, it would be very difficult for me to think that the town would be viewed as being unreasonable when it says we want to keep this to its original purpose of affordable housing. So yeah. it would come back to the town to be an ability to have that discussion at that point. Great. I think so. I saw that. And uh, the only, and I'm not an attorney, but whenever I read unreasonably withheld approval, that seems like it's pretty permissive to me, rather than there being an obligation to to discuss it or, or even uh, even better <laughs> To require someone who is is a private entity or a new a new owner that may not be willing to provide low income senior housing to make sure they're going to pay market market rent and that they would not get a, a pass on taxes um, and um, you know they're they're going to own the building so it just seems to me those are those would be you know. Uh, uh, things that we could write in at some point before uh, you know the question comes up in the future, uh, but I'm you know I'm not uh, I'm not the attorney to figure out how to do that. So, yeah. Attorney Kennedy, can you uh, uh, indicate to us if uh, there is agreement on the part of the developer that upon the transfer of ownership that it would remain uh, senior affordable housing? That that, that is the intent of the documentation well, that we're so, approving? Well, so long as Housing Initiatives owns the project, and they're a nonprofit, they're dedicated to affordable housing, they would be in a position to only have this be affordable housing for seniors. That wasn't quite my question. It was, sorry, say if, it, if, if upon a transfer of ownership, would uh, it be the uh, intent of this documentation that we're approving tonight be that the property upon that transfer would remain affordable senior housing. Well, let me put Cindy Taylor on here, who is uh, the pr president of housing issues. Good evening. Thank you. The uh, restrictive covenants that we will have to sign with Maine State Housing Authority will be um, deeded restrictions. The right. 90 years that are committed for Bessie One, that's a deeded restriction. And we'll have a 45-year restriction on Bessie Commons too. The likelihood of this being sold, I think, is as unlikely as you can imagine. I think it will be always in the hands of housing initiatives, but who knows in 45 years. Um, but I think it's always been the intent that if there was any transfer, that we would be back in front of this council and work with it. We, uh, that's the way we always right. have worked with the community, and we intend to do that. Right. Could you, uh, you referenced uh, covenants that are going to be deed restrictions, so are those are those documents that can be provided to us as well so we can look at those at this time? When we get to a closing, they'll be available. Uh, I have a copy of the Bessie One document with me today that talks yeah. about the 90 year restriction. I can make that available this evening. So, the, the only thing I'd say is that if we're being asked to approve something and those are going to be deed restrictions that we're going to rely on to assure there's going to be low income senior housing, can those be made available and can we, you know, make sure we're comfortable with those and that they, were, they will fulfill what we hope they will do? I believe our attorneys. Uh, viewed those and, and able to speak to them beyond that it might be helpful for the council to be aware of some of the time pressures and, and why uh, the matter is before exactly. you now uh, unfortunately I cannot put an application in, into me housing until I have this TIF agreement mm -hmm. so if we can I would like it very much if you could approve it this evening um, if that does happen um, I think we'll, we'll be prepared to probably submit either Friday or Monday our application. Um, and that will allow us to start construction this fall. 
we're, we're under two time pressures. One is our planning board approvals are up mm -hmm. this, at the end of the fall, and the other pressure is the, um, as you know, construction costs are exorbitant now, and mm -hmm. every two months we're seeing 10% increases. So. Councilor Foley. Yeah, um, two things, and Cindy, while you're there, it's perfect. Um, I think one thing that may be helpful for the public is that, I guess I know at our workshop, uh, you gave us a little background about, some people have said, boy, this is moving awfully fast. Um, and you, you spoke to that. So if you could give people the quick 30,000 foot overview of why we're moving as fast as we are. And then at the workshop, I did <coughs> ask you a question in regards to the percentage of Scarborough residents. And I, you were gonna look into that. I don't know if you did. We don't have a percentage, but we always give a priority for uh, anybody that is from Scarborough. Uh, as that will apply. And right. as you know, the applications come in on a rolling basis, but if somebody comes in and they're from Scarborough, they, and there's any competition, they would be a priority. But you can't look at your existing uh, tenants and residents and say what the percentage is that are, were from Scarborough. That's what the question was at the workshop. And I thought you had said you could provide that. Yeah, I don't have that. Okay, at some point, it but doesn't change my decision one way or the other, but right. it would be, I, I think, interesting and important for taxpayers to understand um, from that perspective. Sure, yeah. We have a lot of people that went to school there that live there. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, Councilor Johnson, then Councilor So Johnson. just as a point of clarification, and I appreciate that these the issues related, but in no way are we acting on anything to do with the lease tonight. This is, I no, mean, I, I understand Don's concerns, but, but we're, this is solely a decision about the TIF district. Yes. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make that clear to the public. And Thank yep. you. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Clutie. Uh, yeah. Just to follow up on Councilor Fo Foley's comments, um, I know you have a wait list for this particular project or for Bessie one, and it'd be interesting to find out how many of those, um, people waiting or in the queue are for Scarborough residents as well. I, I don't know if you have a, a feel for that. I don't have that information, I apologize. Okay. You know, it's interesting because we had a waiting list of almost 100 and uh, we closed that list and we opened it. And in a two week period, we had 60 people back on our list. <laughs> Just to give, you know, if Amazing. you have a waiting list that's a year old, you don't know where those that's people right. have gone. So we then open it back <clears> up again so the number of people that we have is is unbelievable, quite honestly. We're, these, there's only 40 units here, and I think they will be spoken for before we finish the construction. Uh, other questions for uh, Ms. Taylor? Mm -hmm. I don't, I, don't, I answered your questions, good. <clears throat> no, no, it's fine, I'm good. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, further discussion on this? So, um, this, this has been helpful, and I uh, understand and appreciate we're not negotiating the, uh, the lease tonight, and I kind of knew that when I asked the question. The question remains, though, when, if at any time, would we have the opportunity to sit on that question? In our process here, is, you know, when would that be, or doesn't it exist? Well, I think it will be exceedingly difficult since this lease is so tied up in their complicated financing structure. It will be cause huge complications to change, certainly materially, any, any terms of that lease, uh, I believe. I think we should have the assurance, as Attorney Kaminsky mentioned, that at, should there be a uh, transfer or an assignment in the future, uh, this council, or a, a future council, I should say, must consent to that. So there will be an opportunity to, uh, to, to bring that person or that entity before you to understand what they're proposing to do. And I like our chances uh, in that arena in terms of uh, negotiating different terms, uh, given the circumstances that we know at the time. I think given the number of years when it might potentially be renegotiated, it, the uh, landscape could be very different. And you might have a very different approach that you wanted to take. But I would like to say I'd prefer not to amend the lease. We have several partners that are involved in Bessie One, and it would take an act of Congress for me to get approvals. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that's true. If I were an investor, I wouldn't be happy with that either. Um, but uh, the question I've got is what we're authorizing as a council now, and if we see that there are potential issues with it, um, if this, you know, if there's a, a chance for us to understand better what the restrictions will be there that could provide us with protect the sort of protections that Cindy mentions, then you know, I'd like to know if that could be provided and is there a way we can do that so that we're not upsetting the timeline they have in terms of application. 
So uh, and I, I understand full well the planning board process and the other things they have to do, and I'm sure the application is very detailed. You know, my interest here is not delaying any of that. However, uh, these are still questions that are open, and um, uh, the notion of an obligation for the town that doesn't get us uh, what we're paying for, I have a problem with that. And I'm halfway there with the senior housing part. I am not there on the low, you know, the low income part. Um, so. Yeah, it was, it was my intention by the question I asked. We are setting a legislative record by this hearing tonight. Mm -hmm. And so uh, while we are not attempting to make a formal amendment to the lease, we are trying to understand what the intent of the parties, the town, and Bessie Cummins is in this setting. And that was why I wanted to okay. hear it from them, that right. the belief is that this is a commitment to low income affordable housing. Right. And that would be a basis for us potentially in the future to make a follow up request, to negotiate the lease and to require a different owner to pay market rates or whatever. Perhaps. And, and I realize the time frames are, you know, galactic. <clears throat> Perhaps before consent is granted, uh, that's that's the time. Council Mueller. I just wanted to clarify um, the the fact that, uh, as the developer stated, the TIF approval has to come before the yep. deed restrictions are created. Yep. However, Maine State Housing Authority, in awarding low income housing tax credits, they dictate what those deed restrictions say. Yeah. And they have their own very important interests in awarding those tax credits to make sure yeah. that that 45-year, and in the case of SC1, 90-year restrictions are, are robust. So we can certainly make that available. And actually, Attorney Kaminsky just handed me the one for SC1, and I can hand it over to you if you'd like. To Great. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Foley. Uh, overrun the comments anymore, right? Uh, we are in discussion. Discussion. deliberation. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I would just say for me, this is one of the easiest projects that's come before me in my entire time here that, to approve. And that is because this is the, the need I see as one of our greatest needs here um, is affordable senior housing. And it's something I'm very passionate about. I wish they were doing 80 of them, to be honest with you. And um, so, uh, you know, yes, there are, you know, other things to be concerned about and we want to dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's, but I'm uh, enthusiastically supporting this this evening. Other comments? Comes mm -hmm. to Gatorina. Yeah, I, I know personally some people who are on that list, um, and they desperately would like to be out of the situations they're in now where they can't afford where they are. Um, and I, I'm a firm believer in further development of low-income senior housing. It's very much needed in this area in particular. So I will support this also. Other comments? Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, I guess my only comment would be that, uh, in my mind, they're all from Scarborough at this point. I mean, the, the building, I, I mean, it's it's 13 years old, and so that's how, they're all from Scarborough. So I'm not that's concerned right. of where anybody's coming from. They're, they're all my neighbors. So I'm, I'm with Katie. I enthusiastically will support this as well. So. Councilor Pudu. Uh, yeah, I, I support this as well. I, I think Maine's an aging community. Scarborough's certainly an aging community. This is a real need um, that we have, and thank you for bringing it forward. I know it's uh, taken some years since the initial um, development happened for this to be a possibility. So I, I certainly support it. I, uh, as the new guy, was concerned with the pace with which this was brought before us, and there was a lot of um, details to digest. I think I've been able to do that, though, and uh, I think I absolutely support this. Thank you. Uh, I, too, have the uh, uh, full support on this project. I have the greatest admiration for uh, Cindy Taylor. She's one of our outstanding citizens in this community and brings us uh, great benefit from the projects that she's initiated over the years. Uh, any further comment before we vote? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Old business, order uh, 1845, uh, uh, second reading on the proposed second amendment to contract zone, uh, Roman numeral three, Maine Life Care Retirement Community, Inc., located at 5 Dorado Drive. And the planning department is listed as introduction, but if 
uh, if that should. You can probably introduce it as good as anyone. Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, this has been a project that has been before us for, I guess, one solid year. Uh, uh, we've had uh, many hearings, workshops, uh, and uh, opportunities for input. There's been a tremendous exchange between uh, uh, neighbors uh, and counselors, uh, neighbors and the applicant. Uh, and so uh, we find ourselves here today with uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, finally uh, uh, render a ruling on this. Uh, I would like to be able to offer anyone who would like, uh, from the public, who would like to be able to address us on this, please approach the podium. Um, my name is Donald Simino. My wife and I still live at Fort Lucan Bridge and are very much opposed to the Dorado Drive project as planned. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see this, it does not fit into our RF zone. We live in a beautiful area, nice homes, and two acre lots. That's why we live here. My Pichu's proposal far exceeds the loud density, especially the huge hotel building in the middle of it all. The R zone was created to protect such develop against such development. Where is the protection now? Looks to me like zones can be changed to benefit huge companies and help with their bottom line. I don't get it. Where does the regular citizen fit in? I would think we could fit, come first. After all, we are the voters. Some of our families have been here for generations working and paying taxes. I can't understand why a huge company can be allowed to come in and ruin our lives. I beg all of you, just say no. Let us have our town the way previous generations meant it to be. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I'm Anne van der Berg. I moved to this town almost two years ago to live the rest of my life here. And I have found this the friendliest, most welcoming community I have ever lived in. And I've lived in a lot of different communities in my 81 years. I, I could understand the concern of the neighbors to the Dorado property. Uh, it is unfortunate that no zoning law is ever carved in granite. Many of the places that I have lived in have been rezoned, not always to the approval of people living in them. That, is going, that was going on in Mount Desert Island when I lived there. And now that I'm here and hope to spend the rest of my life here in this community, I hope that you will favorably consider the expansion of the Piper Shores development. We are among people from this community. They come and they, they work, they take care of us. That we have in wait staff in the dining room, we probably have some of your children. These are wonderful young people. They're learning how to communicate with old crocs like me. <laughs> And that can sometimes be difficult if I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> but all joking aside, I think that this is a, an opportunity of a lifetime to blend new people with established people. I am very proud to be part of the community of Scarborough. You have wonderful school, wonderful library, beautiful people. I am greeted with help anywhere I go because I have this stupid walker. And everybody's always asking me, can I help you? And that is a wonderful thing to find in a community. We are trying very hard at Piper Shores to make the least impact that we can and still take care of what we need to take care of. I do submit that there will be great benefits to this community 
if the project goes through. We were here early and we were listening to testimony about the schools, taxing, and things like that. Somebody mentioned trails. Uh, if I am, I'm not sure if I'm correctly informed about this, but I think that Piper Shores is possibly the highest tax-paying entity in the town of Scarborough. Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. So we are, I think I've run out of time. <laughs> But I want, to, I want to ask you to really consider this very carefully because we, we at Piper Shores want to be part of the community and we want to contribute to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Andrea Collard. I'm at Five Evergreen Farms Road. I'm also um, the marketing director at Piper Shores. There was a letter that was submitted by Doug Timms of 26 Piper Road to the council today, I believe. He, has, he had requested Piper Shores to read that letter, if that is okay for me to do. Certainly. Uh, dear town council, I am Douglas A. Tim and reside along with my family at 26 Piper Road in Scarborough. Our home and property directly abuts the Piper Shores community at 15 Piper Road. We have been neighbors of Piper Shores since the inception of the community. Our family fully endorses the Piper Shores initiative to develop independent living housing at the current 5 Dorado Drive address. Over the past 18 years, we have been very impressed with the manner in which Piper Shores has supported our relationship with the organization. We have found Piper Shores to be responsive to our requests. They thoughtfully consider solutions whenever matters arise that require their input. This happens very infrequently. Additionally, the community staff and residents are respectful of the neighborhood. There have been instances over the years where Piper Shores has gone above and beyond to be a, quote, good neighbor, unquote. For example, on more than one occasion, Piper Shores has assisted us with issues relating to both weather and vehicle removal from difficult circumstances. In closing, we enthusiastically support Piper Shores' contract zone amendment request to expand the community to the five Dorado Drive parcel. One could not have a better neighbor than Piper Shores. If you wish to follow up with me directly, our home telephone number is, do I give you number? 207. I would say not. Huh? I would no, not okay, you. thank you. <laughs> Sincerely, Doug Tim of 26 Piper Road. If you would submit the letter to the town clerk, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Be made part of the record. Others wishing to uh, address the town council on this matter? Close the public hearing. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Uh, uh, we have we have one procedural point. Uh, when you have a circumstance such as we have here. Uh, at first reading, you vote to approve the documentation uh, and it moves forward to second reading. Here, we have so modified the document that rather than trying to read into the record the changes, <clears throat> it's customary, uh, we post that document, and that was part of the package with the agenda posted on Friday, and everyone in the council had it, it's in the public domain. Uh, we normally uh, uh, move to amend uh, the uh, matter from first reading documentation to that which was posted in the uh, agenda on Friday. And uh, in this circumstance, because we uh, have a temporary chair, because of the absence of the chair, I will make the motion to amend uh, to substitute what was approved at first reading for this second reading. Mm -hmm. And for, it, so and for all those, for identifying purposes, it was included in the uh, information as a red line version, so you could see the changes from first reading and, uh, and all the movements since then. I'd second that motion. Uh, good. Uh, open for deliberation and discussion. Uh, the motion has been amended. We will procedurally vote on the amendment and then the final, but I think comments now are probably in order on uh, 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 if you wish to make comments on your viewpoint on this, 
uh, now, I certainly accept them now. So anyone wishing to, uh, uh, to speak uh, on Mr. the amendment? Mr. Chair, can, can we just do, finish the amendment procedure before we come? Is, I just think it'd be easier for the public to understand. I'd Very like to good. get the amendment out of the way and then. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion on the mo motion to amend? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, we now have a main motion as amended uh, that is uh, uh, on the table. Uh, discussion. Anyone wishing uh, to uh, discuss this? So I have, I have a question, and I'm not sure if someone from Piper Shores can answer. This was actually uh, something that came to me from a member of the public today, and you may or may not know the answer. I, I think you probably do, will. Um, the question was two parts. One, um, is Piper Shores part of, and I sadly I should have known some of these answers and I didn't, is Piper Shores part of uh, a larger corporation where there's two or three communities of this, you know, in other parts of the country? And if so, in any of those uh, communities, do you actually have a senior center embedded within uh, those communities? And I apologize for the late um, entry, but someone earlier did it, so I gave me permission. And it is not uh, 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 uncustomary for us to allow counselors to ask questions of the applicant so as to be able to get a very clear sense. Uh, Thank you. Hello. Uh, Jim Matamovich, CEO of Piper Shores. In response to uh, Council Foley's question, Piper Shores is not part of a larger organization. <clears throat> the corporate name is Maine Life Care Retirement Community Doing Business as Piper Shores. The 15 Piper Road address is the only address, and it's the only operation that we participate in. Thank you. You're welcome. Further discussion? I'll, I'll start. Mr. Johnson, then Councilor Clubio. Yeah, sure. Uh, so to me, I think in this whole process, I, I, the, there's been a lot of discussion about public good. Um, there's been a lot of discussion what I what I would consider uh, not so much the big issue for me. Uh, I think from the beginning I've had the biggest issue with the apartment complex that sits on the site. I, after the last couple of weeks of um, soul searching and looking over the ordinances and the comprehensive plan, I think two thirds of this project fit the comprehensive plan uh, quite nicely. I think the two neighborhoods are uh, exactly how they're supposed to be and how they're, they're asked to be. That is that they're clustered, there's focus on duplexes, townhouses, and there's open space. Uh, in addition to that, I think the setbacks are more generous than they are that are required into the RF zone. So what this has come down to me is, does is that apartment building enough for me to feel like this doesn't fit? Uh, and I, part of this contract zone is it's a requirement of the contract zone that it, that the current zoning doesn't allow it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be before us. So if, if, I, if I try to argue this in the context of exactly the current zoning, it, it's, it's, not it's not necessarily supposed to be allowed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be before us. So I'm looking at this of the word compatible. Is this apartment complex compatible? And I think the word compatible can be stretched or taken as literally as somebody might want it to. Uh, so it's come down to this for me, I think that the uh, not all density is created equal. I think this is an example that it is above the density, uh, but this is the type of density that is a lower impact than uh, 52 units would be elsewhere. It's a lower impact, in my opinion, for light pollution, for noise pollution, for services of the town. It's a lower impact in a many different ways. Uh, I do not like the apartment complex. I do not like the fact that we decided it wasn't an apartment complex and we decided to talk about something else. Uh, but with that being said, I think this project is good enough that I'm not going to allow that to sway me into the no category. So I'm going to support that th this evening, and, and that's precisely why. Thank you. Yep. Councilor Cloutier. Thank you. Um, I, I also support uh, this project. It's actually, it was one of my platforms, uh, and I feel like the public had an opportunity to weigh in uh, through the, the most recent election. Um, I think there's just a lot of opportunity, and similar to the VESI, um, Commons project, there is a dire need for senior housing and uh, you know, kind of sugar on top of this one is it also provides lifetime care, uh, which is difficult to come by. It's a new model um, and I want to see it succeed. 
I think the plans that have brought, been brought forth have been thoughtfully done and considerate of the neighbors. And uh, that doesn't mean that it's, it's not uncomfortable uh, to have a major construction project happen in your backyard. So um, I'd like to see us take some precautions and, and the developer to uh, make sure that they're mindful of the neighbor's concerns and, and try to do this in the best way possible. Thank you. Councilor Katerina. Um, yeah, I, again, this has been a long process. It's, as uh, Councilor Donovan mentioned, it's been a year. Um, I started out going, are you kidding me? Um, I met with neighbors. Um, I talked to people from Piper Shores. I've looked at all the zoning, um, um, upside, downside, um, and I feel that um, I can support this wholeheartedly. And the reason for that is that unlike a development that would have I don't know, however, however many uh, single-family homes on two-acre lots. The uh, Piper Shores, the way, it, it, the, the way it's planned to be developed, the buffering, the uh, lighting requirements, um, minimal traffic impact, all of those features um, are pluses. Um, and like um, um, Councillor Johnson, I when I first saw the apartment building or whatever you want to call it in the middle, I was like, eh, but they've, they've worked. They've, they've reduced it. I don't think, I know I was getting letters from people that I, most of them were on Acorn Drive that were talking about, oh, it's five feet above. Well, I don't think, I don't think it's five feet that much beyond. I mean, 35 feet is what's allowed in RF zoning. So to be just under that I think it's 39 and some inches is, is the, the exact measurement, to me is not outrageous. And it is one of the reasons we've come forward with um, a con the so-called contract zone. I, I get it. Um, I live in RF. The lot right next to me that's contiguous, if we want to use that term, to my house was RF and it got rezoned. And it, now it could become some type of commercial. but you know, that's change, that's life. Um, and I feel that we've done a darn good job addressing the neighbor's issues. And I think Piper Shores has done a good job. They have not been happy with us. So to me, that's pretty good. They're not happy. The neighbors aren't happy. So to me, that's not a bad negotiation when it all <laughs> is said and done. Um, and I, I, I had to look at the bigger picture because one of the things with contract zoning is what's the, and you know, I'm a former Latin teacher, the quid pro quo, uh, what's in it for the town, and there's, a, there's quite a bit of tax value uh, for the town here, and Piper Shores isn't gonna be putting children in the schools. Not that there's anything wrong with kids in schools. I, I think that children are a good thing. They're a great commodity, they're our future. But they're not putting kids in schools. They aren't asking us to plow. Uh, they're offering conservation land. They're, um, I've never had an issue myself. I'm, I'm a person who wanders about on the Piper Shores campus. I don't know if they've ever seen me there, but I mean, they do have current trails. Um, they're gonna, you know, they're not putting up, you know, no trespassing signs. My one request, well, actually several requests are, you know, that we get the, the berms and trees done immediately so that they're so the neighbors are buffered from any construction um, I would ask that we actively pursue and I know we've been discussing a sidewalk for acorn lane I mean that's been that's been on the back burner for a number of years actually um, I would like to I know lighting you know anything we can do to minimize lighting someone wrote a very good letter to us regarding the impact of lights. Yeah, I live in an IRF zone, but I'm kind of close to the mall, and I can tell when I look over towards the mall, you can't see any of the stars or anything, but you look the other way, you can. I want to maintain, you know, very low lighting um, at night, and I feel strong, I feel very confident that Piper Shores will work with us on that, and I'm looking at the planning board <laughs> to also, uh, as they move along, put those in. So I will be supporting this project. 
Councilor Hamel. Uh, I agree uh, with much uh, that has been said by uh, mm -hmm. those that are in support of this project. Uh, it's been a journey, I know, for everyone. Uh, and and I made many revolutions in the process. Spent a lot of time uh, with the folks who were abutters, and um, I, I think uh, as a community we've done a good job of hearing all of the issues. And uh, it's taken a year, but that's just, you know it's, it's really <coughs> taken that long to to vet everything and to hear hear everyone out. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I know there are people who'll be unhappy about that, and uh, you know I I. I uh, think if I lived there, I'd have similar feelings. Uh, that may not make you feel any better about the outcome. Uh, however, I think that as a community, we're at a point where we uh, really need to be open-minded about projects like this. I, I think, it, as everyone has said, uh, it met most of the criteria spot on and some uh, close, but close enough, I think, uh, in stepping back and looking at the overall benefit to the community. It's hard, to, it's hard for me to come out differently than voting in favor of it. Um, and I just think this is the sort of process we are going to have to follow, and we'll have similar tough questions like this in the future. But I think as we get better at this, we, we ought to hopefully it ought to be easier on people, and we ought to have uh, do a better job of coming out with the right answers. So I'm very encouraged by that. Um, and finally, I just want to I want to thank the my fellow counselors. I mean, I think if we had to track everybody's position on this, it mm. moved all over the place, and I think we've done a a very good job of really listening to one another and not trying to make arguments, really really trying to dive deep to understand uh, exactly the other person's perspective and to work the detail and sweat through all of the contract language about it. The first Piper Shores uh, effort, it took seven years. So um, I think we have a proven operator. We can trust that they will deliver on their commitments. And I think at the end of the day, we'll end up with something that we can all be very proud of. So I will be voting in favor of this. So every group needs a contrarian, and I'm going to offer a few contrar contrary points, um, as I will not be supporting the project this evening. But I want to be clear as to why, um, because there's been a lot of conversation and discussion as to, you know, people talking about Piper being a great partner and a, and a great community member, and there's, I, there's no doubt that they have been all of those things. Um, and that it is a lovely community. And so there are a few things for me when I am considering a contract zone that I, I just want to point out my position. And that is that for me, a contract zone is an exception to the law. It's an exception to what we've, a pattern that we've established that is, you know, supposedly the best route for our town. And that exception for me has to really, I, I got to feel wholeheartedly in support of it, not mostly or two thirds. Other decisions I make, I might only feel 50 or 60 percent in favor. Um, this is a, a situation where I feel like I really needed to be uh, either 100 percent there or I couldn't support it. Um, and some of those sticking points for me, I'm not going to belabor it and go into every point, but there are a few that I think are pretty principled, and hopefully people will understand my position on them. And one is, um, and we just talked about affordable housing and inclusion. Um, I've been very clear, and, and this won't be a surprise to Jim or his team, I have been very clear all along that uh, I really believe strongly in the idea of inclusionary models. I did when I was a teacher in schools. I fought and advocated for my students um, who were sometimes uh, kept out of classrooms. And in this particular case, I understand their business model is a little different. However, we're talking about five apartments. Out of 52 units, we couldn't find a way to work a model to have five apartments be for folks who would require a little lower uh, income level. I think there was a way to do it. And, um, you know, and, and I think a contract zone is the opportunity for a council to be able to kind of make those kinds of uh, demands and leverage. So that's one, one piece for me. Um, and then there were a few things. I, I, I think we came a long way from where the fir proposal first started. And uh, I give everybody, the neighbors, uh, Piper Shores team, kudos for improving the project and addressing a lot of the concerns. Um, for me, I would have liked to see more than seven parking spots for the public uh, for, to access those trails. Um, and I think the other piece for me is also with contract zones, they, last time they came before us, um, which was not any of us sitting here, but the council in general, um, this is it. We're not going to be coming back. <coughs> At some point, 
we have to set a precedence of not continuing to allow that kind of uh, pushing with contract zones. So those are kind of the three big ones for me. There's a, f the few other pieces. Um, and last but not least, there is, you know, this, this concern around uh, conservation and using conservation as an economic development uh, strategy. And it, it's a very good one. Um, one of the concerns that I have from a big picture, and this isn't Piper's issue or anyone else's, but there's a large tract of land back there that is still unprotected. Um, and, you know, just as the, the wild, Wildwood neighborhood was, that street was developed, there's now if the infrastructure is provided, there's another large tract of Camp Ketchel land that could also be developed. And I'm not saying it will or it won't, but I think it's something to keep an eye on. This corridor of Scarborough for me is one of the things I fell in love with when I moved here. And um, for me, again, not close enough, it just doesn't fit with my idea of preserving that coastal corridor uh, in that limited growth area. So again, um, I do appreciate everyone's work. It has been a long process. And I, I think, as Councillor Hamill said, um, one of the things I've enjoyed this past year is the I'm going to support it. I'm not going to support it. I'm going to support it. And people changing their positions, I think that's healthy. I think that's robust debate at its finest. Um, and I think our town actually needs more of that on more issues. So to be, you know, I respect everybody's view here and the points they made tonight are all valid. I just have a little bit of a, a different perspective and some principles that I'm kind of, you know, falling on my sword around. So um, that's what I had to say. So thank you. Thank you. Ask one more question. Yes. So I think uh, you sent an email out late this afternoon outlining some other things that mm -hmm. we had. Are you going to address those things? I am. Because there were some very. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank the town council leadership for uh, pushing uh, Piper Shores to an agreement that I could support. Uh, uh, and uh, and that uh, that was very important to me. I know that uh, after passing the baton of chair to Councillor Hayes, uh, who could not be here tonight, it was disappointing. I know he's been very involved and engaged in this project, but he did a very good job uh, of uh, advancing the interests of the community. Um, some legal aspects of this, uh, it, this is a four-part legal test under our uh, ordinance and under uh, state law. Uh, the whereas clauses are where you would look to to see the findings and the town council, as we all know, who've read Crispin v. Town of Scarborough, uh, findings are made by the town council and they're reflected in the documentation. So that's where you would look and they really do demonstrate why uh, uh, it, it's complied with. Uh, there's no question that the most focused upon issue has been the size of the apartment building. Uh, and it really wasn't until I dug into the zoning ordinance and looked at the RF zone that I saw that there's all sorts of examples of oversized buildings that are recognized as being allowable. And when I dug further with the planning director, <clears throat> I learned that the buildings, subject to a 35-foot limitation, could be much larger than what's there. Uh, and that was uh, 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 sobering for me because I realized that uh, the zoning only protects property so much. A contract zone, however, puts us in charge of being able to restrict and predict what's going to come out of this. Uh, I have the greatest respect for Piper Shores. I live near them. Uh, they are one of the great neighbors uh, in this community. Uh, and so I have been able to come to grips with the oversized nature of the apartment building. I've also been impressed by the considerations that have been exacted uh, uh, to protect the neighborhood. Uh, the buffering uh, and I think Acorn is, is buffered all by itself, and I've walked the land down through that trail system several times in the last week uh, to see if I could even see 
the houses down there. And it is very difficult, even when you're near their property line, to see those houses. Uh, uh, and I've really gotten to know the McDonald's a little bit, because I'd knock on the door and ask permission each time I've went. Uh, but, uh, but Newcomb Ridge, uh, uh, they deserve to be able to not, if they don't choose to, to have to have it in their face. And uh, I'm uh, uh, confident that the buffering requirements that we've set in place are going to be effective. Uh, Anybody who's been around the Piper Shores, Higgins Beach neighborhood know that there is open access on their campus. And they've committed very publicly in these proceedings to open access to this. And if you've ever walked out on this property, it is one beautiful property. Uh, and because of the clustered requirements that this development is going to be subject to, we are going to have a lot of open space. And I think while it can be frustrating for a neighborhood, when you weigh against it the thing you don't even know versus this, which is a beautifully designed and constructed development with a great deal of open space and your right to have access to it, uh, along with, uh, and I was amazed at the, at the quality of the walking trails that Mr. McDonald all of him at 88, age 86, goes out and, and, and keeps open and, 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 and under a repair. Uh, the conservation land issue was sticky, uh, but we pressed on it and it was moved forward, it was expanded and brought all the way up to Jeff Jones' property, which I think was uh, a, a very good gesture on the part of uh, Piper Shores. There's two aspects of this that I really would highlight, uh, and they're community benefits. There's $250,000 to be contributed to the town's reserve fund for affordable housing. <clears throat> I've not favored having affordable housing on this because I've worked for companies that run this kind of managed care, uh, uh, independent living, assisted living, nursing, and I know that the model is dependent on the integrity of it being available uh, on market conditions because it's very actuarial based uh, uh, to be uh, run at a profit. Uh, but I was very pleased when, uh, uh, when the chair and the vice chair came back with uh, a doubling of that amount. Uh, we've had Bessie Commons here tonight and Bessie Commons uh, received a grant of 100,000 and seeking another 100,000 uh, for their project. So we figured it out, my math was wrong last meeting, but this meeting I'll get it right, $5,000 a unit. Well, $250,000 will get you 50 units. And there are people in the affordable housing uh, realm, people say, deal with people who will do it for a business. Uh, the Kevin Bunkers of the world, the Avestas of the world. Those are the people who know how to do affordable housing. And uh, we've had Kevin Bunker in front of us at the Affordable Housing Alliance, and, uh, and he's planning uh, a very substantial, low-income, affordable senior uh, housing project at the Downs. Uh, and, and dollar for dollar, we stretch our dollars, which now have reached a million dollars by using contract zone negotiations to get money. Uh, and it's been, very, it's been very successful. So I'm very proud of the community for doing that. I also have, for six years, gone through budgets with a commitment to try and keep the budget below a 3% tax impact. And the 2013 through 2019 was a dicey period from time. It was hard to do. Schools were looking to get their money back that had been lost in 2010, 11, and 12. Uh, but we've kept that commitment to people. <clears throat> One of the ways we are going to be successful in the future in making that commitment stick <clears throat> is having projects like this. You're probably talking uh, a $40 million value project here. And at a $16.49 tax rate, that's <clears throat> $600,000 
uh, in, uh, in increased property taxes where no school uh, costs, no plowing costs, no trash costs. Uh, they have to, ambulances, we charge for ambulances when people go up there for an EMS call. So it's, it's a tremendous benefit. So if you're a fiscally responsible person, a person who thinks that the little people in town who have tax bills, that they love Scarborough, they want to remain in Scarborough, but they don't want to be, to, want to be choked out by high taxes, this is a huge win for that, for that element of our community. And I think we all, seven of us, want to be looking out for that group. So those are the two things I wanted to, to, uh, uh, to stress. <clears throat> there were a number of things that have been asked that I support, and I know other councilors have supported. I uh, worked with Councilor Johnson on coming up with a list, and, uh, and I circulated it to other councilors who expressed support for a number of these. And I'll tell you what they are. Um, the town <clears throat> uh, is to seek a reduced speed limit on Spurwink Road. This process has already begun. The town manager has initiated it with the police department, which is the start, get uh, tra traffic speed data, and then go to the, st the state uh, and, and make our case. And we will do that. Uh, uh, and I live in that neighborhood, and so I believe in this commitment. Uh, it should be lowered. Once you canopy the, the uh, street around uh, uh, Piper Road, uh, from there to the market, uh, the speed limit should be reduced. Uh, uh, there's been a, a request for a proposed sidewalk from Acorn to Ocean Avenue, uh, and I support that, and others do as well. Uh, uh, the town manager, uh, 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 in meeting with me, uh, uh, agreed that we should have that evaluated by the DPW director. He has done so. He considers this to be quite feasible. Uh, and uh, I would hope that we would be able to get a confirmation on costs, a, D, uh, a DOT uh, approval, and, and, and start the process uh, later this fall. Uh, there are several things that I would like to uh, uh, think the planning board would consider uh, in there, uh, because this now would go to final site plan approval. Uh, <clears throat> I would want them to really be certain that the Newcomb, Newcomb Ridge berm and plantings uh, uh, be done first, uh, so that before any construction on the site occurs, that kind of vegetative uh, 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 buffering uh, occurs. Uh, I would want the planning board to ensure that the proposed berm and the associated landscaping is sufficient and serves the intended purpose of screening and buffering the view from Newcomb Bridge in an appropriate way. Uh, uh, I would request that the planning board ask Piper Shores to explain the impact on the apartment building's function if its height and we've, we've been after them to reduce the height. It was 40, it's now 39 uh, and a half. What if it was reduced to 39 or 38? What would be the impact on the function of the building? Uh, 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 and leave that to the planning board, which is where it should rest to, to evaluate. Uh, I would ask that the planning board require Piper Shores to provide signage that informs the public of access to the campus and the conservation land. Uh, I'd ask the planning board to uh, 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 review the lighting dimmer provisions that are in the site plan application uh, to see if the dimmers could be employed earlier than the 11 p.m. time frame that uh, uh, has been settled. Uh, uh, I'm not suggesting a time. Uh, uh, that really is best left to deliberations and discussion between Piper Shores and the planning board. That's what they're there for. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, I would like to be able to see publicly identified a liaison to the neighborhood mm. for presentation of construction concerns, uh, as well as uh, a contact person at the planning department for construction concerns. So this process can go as smoothly as possible. Thank you for your patience. Any further comments or questions? Mm -hmm.
Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Five to one. I got Thank confused, you. sorry. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Give uh, a, a minute to allow uh, everyone uh, who was here for that uh, order to uh, be able to. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, my goodness. Okay. In the meeting to order, we're on to new business on the agenda, order number 19-49, first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 302, Scarborough Town Council Rules and Procedures, Section 300, Subsection 304, Policy on Publicly Speaking as a Representative of the Town Council as a Body. Uh, I'm Chair of the Rules and Policies Committee, so I'll introduce the uh, matter. Uh, it really was designed to provide a simple, uh, understandable framework uh, when uh, a council member wishes to, uh, as Jean Marie Caterina did on several occasions, go to the state legislature and testify. Uh, she feels strongly about an issue herself, but she feels like the uh, overwhelming majority of the council feels the same way. Uh, so what we have done is a simple process uh, it was unanimously endorsed by Councilors Johnson and Foley, who sit with me on the Rules and Policies Committee, to have a resolution framework. And we have resolutions all the time uh, that state whereas clauses and then a conclusion. And in the body of that document, you would recite the information that you want to convey uh, uh, to the public, whether it's in a letter to the editor, whether it's testifying before uh, a body uh, of the legislature in Augusta. Uh, so with that, I will ask anyone wishing to approach the podium to discuss this matter, please do so now. We're just getting along. Accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Councilor Caterino. As the person who's frequently <laughs> asking for permission to speak uh, for the council, I think this makes perfect sense. Uh, and actually, I like that it's a, by a vote of five, it's not just a simple majority because then it's really clear. I mean, it's not, you know, oh, well, it's four and three, but yep. it yep. makes it way more clear. And the other thing is, uh, when I am talking to the legislature, um, if I have something in hand that I can give them, it says, look, this is from the council, see? Yeah. It's not just me talking yeah. as a counselor, it's from my council. So that carries a lot more weight. So this would be helpful. It really does. Other comments, Councilor Foley? Yeah, I just enjoyed the conversation around this. Um, I, you know, this has come up a few times and I like the fact that we now have something to kind of, before when it came up, we didn't really have anything to go by and now we have a process and I think that's important. Other comments? Seeing none, I think you're ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, order 1950, uh, uh, 
First reading and schedule a second reading on the request to approve the expenditure in an amount not to exceed $90,721 from the Land Acquisition Reserve Fund for the purpose of purchasing a portion of the Blue Point Congressional Church property located more specifically identified by the Scarborough Tax Assessor's Map Map U025 slash lot 0115 as recommended by the Parks and Conservation Land Board and authorize the town manager to execute any and all documents as are necessary to protect the town's interests. Thank you. I'll look to the Parks and Land Conservation Board representative. Thank you. Um, Suzanne Foley Ferguson. I'm the Parks and Conservation Land Board Chair. Um, I am here to ask you for some money. <laughs> uh, to be precise, it's $90,721, plus or minus, um, and I think you all understand why um, the amount of land bond funds is, um, has been, you know, um, I made a mistake when we took the vote, it was a little bit of a dyslexia thing, $90,271, so you might have seen some um, errors in the, in the numbers, and that's what it's about. Um, but the town manager and the town finance director are going to know a lot better what the real numbers are. Um, the Parks and Conservation Land Board, I want to just go over just a little bit about um, the history, only in the sense that I know there's some new yeah. counselors that have never yeah. voted on this. So in the year 2000, 2000 That's the last time. we had our first land bond vote, and the citizens overwhelmingly supported uh, $1.5 million. Over the next two, um, <coughs> 10 years, actually, where's my, ah, I'm looking for the, you guys have the, here it is. The next was 2003. Sorry, 2003 was 1.5. 2003 and then 2009, the total of $5 million was appropriated, or actually wasn't appropriated, it was approved by the voters to purchase land, um, conservation land for the community or hist for historical preservation purposes. And when we first did the land bond, the, um, the council appointed a committee to develop an acquisition evaluation process that um, was supposed to be objective so that when, so that all the questions can be answered before it came to town, town council, that we can compare them to other valuable parcels and so that we would be good stewards of the money that uh, I think the fact that $5 million has lasted 18 years, I think uh, that says something good. The land trust hasn't gotten all crazy and said, we want money, we want money, you know. I think that the projects that have come forward have been incredible projects. We have approximately over 100 a thousand, excuse me, a thousand seventy-eight acres that have already been protected by land bond funds, and um, unfortunately, this these are going to this is going to whittle our fund down to almost zero. Um, so that's another conversation we can have. But this particular project is a very valuable project, and I'm, I'd like to tell you why. But first, I also want to mention that I'm not the only one that was involved in this. I'm I'm not. Um, our committee consists of a number of different people, um, and usually we partner with another organization, whether it be the main, main Farmland Trust or the Scarborough Land Conservation Trust. Richard Bard is here. He's the executive director of the Land Trust, and he can come up and answer any questions probably specifically about the project, and Betts Armstrong is also a representative on the board um, of the Scarborough Land Trust. So we're just here, I am just here to make a recommendation on behalf of my committee, um, whose names I lost, but I'm going to give you in a second. Um, this project is important because it sits off of Pine Point Road and it's adjacent to the marsh. And the marsh is over 3,000 acres, and it, if you know anything about interconnectivity of conservation lands, it is most important to have large parcels because it, it protects the most types of species. It provides the most diverse types of habitats. That particular parcel, which is right adjacent to the Witten, Witten piece, um, includes some freshwater wetlands as well as salt marsh 
so and as well as upland. And it also provides an area for public access. So it's really a win, 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 win uh, in, in all cases. And you received a number of photos, and you can see what the beautiful photos. Um, I think it's the intent of the land trust to have a, a path you see here in red on the map out to perhaps so you can see the marsh. They haven't committed to doing some kind of a lookout tower, but those kinds of things have been discussed. Um, the land bond funds are not used for those kinds, they're just used for the land acquisition piece of it. Um, I think that's that's pretty much all I have. I, if you guys have a packet, do you, I guess I'd like to know if you have any questions. And most of the questions are going to probably be answered by Rich. But let me mention the, the members of my committee, Rachel Hendrickson, Doug Williams, Sean Flaherty, Rick Murphy, Jane Palmer, and two former um, members, Mark Pauley and Paul Austin. Um, and we all have done the site walks, and we've all done the hard work um, the last many years, 18 years, I can't believe it. So, so anyway, we all heartily support this, and I hope you will too. If counselors have questions, uh, please feel free to ask now whether it's Mm -hmm. No. Good. Thank you. I do have, I have a question for you. For you um, Certainly. It, I thought in the past that because these were voter-approved bonds, that the, it was only necessary to have one reading and not a public hearing. Okay. Don't quote me on that one. Do you, do you oh, know? Gonna, there's no public hearing. It's the first and second reading. This is first and second? No, this first This is first, second. but you will have to have a second reading? That's my understanding, yes. So, so I apologize to land trust because I think I spoke incorrectly. Through the chair, I, I did have one question. Uh, I, Certainly. I, I recognize that this would deplete the, the funds currently set aside um, for conservation. Do you have other projects in the pipeline that uh, you're working on now? I'm trying to understand what the urgency might be for replenishing those funds. Well, I would have to say, I would have to defer to the land trust about this because our role has never been to get the projects. Um, other organizations would come to us and we would have helped the town evaluate the, pro the properties. The one time when we knew there was one was when the Pleasant Hill Preserve, which was the former Benjamin Farm, we knew that was in the, in the works. And so we were careful to take on any of the projects, but the land trust might have other projects in the works. Hi, uh, Rich Bard, Executive Director of Scarborough Land Trust. Um, we haven't brought any other projects to the Parks and Conservation Land Board at this point, but there are projects in the pipeline to answer your question. Um, they're ones that we can't talk about publicly at this point, but there will be more. And I asked Rich to keep us advised so that we would have the opportunity to take action on a bond if necessary, and we'd be able to evaluate it uh, since this would be a land purchase. So I don't know. I don't Johnson? Yeah, I don't. It might be for Mr. Hall or do. How do we determine the amount of the bond approval when it comes time? So it sounds like there's two different, right? A million, a million and a half, and so how do, how does that conversation get framed? Is that a recommendation from? Our our recommendation is. Um, to bond ninety, approximately ninety thousand. Oh, I meant after this. I'm sorry. I was, oh, and yeah, yeah. He's, he's talking about I'm following up on John's question, on Mr. Cloutier's question. Yeah. Well, it sounds. I, yeah. I suspect uh, some of it was informed by potential deals that were okay. contemplated. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you the most recent one, the million dollars, was uh, response was response to a matching opportunity for the Maine Community Foundation, and so mm -hmm. that's why that was sized at a million. Uh, but I think it makes sense to have some justification or yeah, rationale sure. for the amount. I'd like to mention also that we've leveraged over four million three hundred dollars as well. I have documentation of other funds that I've used, and the land for Maine's future is um, coming up for review at the state house. And so hopefully that will pass the voters. And if that's the case, we would love to be in, in a position to be able to get that kind of matched money from the state because that's that's where really that. 50-50 match 
has come in the past. Yeah, yeah and I, I would point out to people that once we've used this uh, bond funding up, uh, a new bond request of the voters, if approved, doesn't mean we pay any interest because we do not draw, we don't actually take the bond out uh, until it's actually needed. Uh, so that, that's a real advantage. It's, a, it's a, obviously two, two and a half percent out of the going rates for bonds, but uh, there's, no, there's no loss. It's important to plan for the future. Uh, and we, we need to, now that this is brought to our attention uh, with this very good acquisition at Blue Point Preserve and the uh, exhaustion of the money, I think it's probably time that we uh, bring this forward, so. Yeah, I would say I think it's nice to have authorization in hand so we can take advantage of our opportunities. In most cases, real estate transactions uh, are time sensitive. Uh, and I can envision that that could be the case, although many of these deals are known well in advance and you have the ability of some time. But having authorization in hand uh, to be able to react when the opportunity presents itself would be very nice. Further, uh, we have a motion and second. No, this is all good. In public, any further public comment? Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> My name is Barry Cheney, and I'm in the circle. I'm the president of the Scarborough Land Trust, and I just did two things. First, I want to thank Sue and her committee for the thorough review of this and the, the uh, you know, uh, support of this project. Uh, we appreciate that effort very, very much. Uh, second, this is a very important project for the trust. It's the first piece that we will acquire and develop for public access on this side of town. Uh, it actually, as you uh, know from Sue's summary, it's two pieces. The uh, so-called Witten piece, which actually we owned quite some time ago, uh, subject to a life estate to the late Mr. Witten, and unfortunately mm -hmm. taxes weren't paid, and the town acquired that property through foreclosure. It's tax lien. Part of this transaction involves uh, our paying, the land trust paying the town a certain amount of money cover those back taxes to get that piece back. There was some controversy about Bradford Lane that provides access to that parcel. The neighbors were not uh, overly enthusiastic about uh, a lot of uh, potential vehicle and foot traffic to get uh, going down there. The church approached us somewhat out of the blue and said we would be interested in discussing and selling the adjacent piece to you. And we now have that under contract. And that will allow us to have an access directly from CB Landing a Road and a little parking area so that we will not be using Bradford Lane at all. So we've solved that issue for that neighborhood while providing essentially a doubling in size of, of the property by virtue of the church possibly being a part of it. So we're, we're enthusiastic about this project. We appreciate the potential town financial support to help us uh, pull it together. Um, we hope to close soon. We have a commitment from Risk Bearer Construction to help us remove the, the house that's there. So a lot of things are falling into place with a lot of hard work uh, by a lot of people. And we are hopeful that you will support this request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I just ask, is there any sensitivity? Do you have a closing scheduled? Or this is on a path for it to come back and be approved at the council's next What's meeting? What's our deadline? Close back January 10th. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we, okay. we have some conditions. Okay, good. So it's not that sensitive. But good. Thank it, you. it will be back before us in July. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Further comment from the public? Accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion? Councilor Caterina. Um, I'm all in favor of this. I, I don't know, there's something about the land down there and CV landing that's really cool, particularly when the moon's coming up. Um, it's, it's a beautiful uh, entrance into the marsh. 
Uh, and when you're at the very end of CV land, I'm not sure from this particular land, but when you look up on a clear day, you can see Mount Washington at the head uh, of that area, too. So I enthusiastically support this. I think the more land we can uh, preserve near the ocean, uh, the better, and marshes. So. Other comments? Can we get Piper Shores to pay for it? <laughs> oh, it just it's too late. That just passed. That is all. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your lucid comment. <laughs> I, I'm really ex excited about the project as well. I, I love the area down by Cedar Landing and uh, to protect a, a significant uh, parcel of land and provide public access and a trail I think is wonderful. So thank you for bringing this forward. Got to vote. I uh, would concur with my fellow counselors and, and add to that, um, particularly grateful for the work on, you know, heading off a problem that we don't have to head off now by addressing that issue with the church and acquiring that piece and creating that parking. Now we're not going to be dealing with neighbors, so we like that whenever we can, so I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, I, too, support this strongly. Uh, the Scarborough Land Trust has uh, made a true commitment to be good stewards of the land and, and, and that really is very widely perceived within the community. So uh, with that, do you vote? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, order 19-51, uh, act on the request to authorize the town manager to sign an easement deed and release on the Scarborough Downs Road between the Town of Scarborough, m &R Holdings, and Rosbera-related entities. And I asked the town manager to introduce this. Yes, there was a letter uh, in your packet that I think gave a good uh, explanation as to why this matters before us. But uh, in essence, the town has held for some number of years or decades uh, an easement, uh, essentially along Scarborough Downs Road. Uh, as part of their most recent development, they've slightly relocated that road for their own purposes, uh, not widely, but enough such that it uh, our easement does no longer uh, follow specifically the uh, location of that existing road. So in the first instance, they're looking for the town to release its prior interest in that, and then in turn uh, receiving a, an easement deed back for the, the new location of the road. As a practical matter, uh, these roads will become public, and so this easement will not be necessary. And really, this matters before you tonight. Uh, it is uh, holding up a closing they have, uh, and so it's a matter of a kind of a legal procedure Otherwise, we do this on the back end as part of the street acceptance process. So um, we certainly uh, encourage you to support this. Thank you. Uh, public comment on the matter. I have a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mm -hmm. People feel comfortable with the explanation yeah. the town manager has provided? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, Non-action items done, standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, Don, let's start down here with you. Uh, just a couple of things to report. I'm um, looking forward to attending the uh, Echo Maine uh, Annual Board of Directors meeting yesterday, so I'll be joining Mike Shaw on that uh, as a member of the Executive Committee. Um, and uh, the Finance Committee, I thought I'd mention something in Peter's absence. Uh, uh, we're looking forward to meeting on, on Wednesday. We have a host of issues. Uh, including a, a chance to uh, uh, update on some of the uh, uh, the dashboard work that's been done in the past. We're going to do a, uh, uh, a reprise of the of the budget process that we followed this past year and a discussion of what we might do differently. Uh, there are a number of other items we're going to cover as well, including uh, we're going to discuss bonds as well as um, the TIF uh, policy. Uh, that's right. The TIF policy will, will be mm -hmm. part of our review as well. So an, uh, a robust agenda. I'm glad that we will also have meetings in July and August as well. So uh, thanks to Tom and the finance team for pulling that together so quickly. And uh, we're looking forward to, to moving on with uh, a full agenda for finance. I, I should mention, I believe it's Councillor, or excuse me, Chair uh, Hayes' intention to uh, recommend and appoint uh, Councillor Johnson to uh, sit in uh, former Councillor he seemed surprised at <laughs> Baymine's position. Uh, that obviously was not able to be done. Uh, so if, if I'm correct, I think invitations will be sent and you'll be encouraged to attend the meeting next week. 
I'll be there. Yeah. And to be on your best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Council Gatorino. Uh, ordinance tomorrow at 4 o'clock. We have absolutely, we have one topic, marijuana. I have received some emails from interested constituents. Um, what's going to happen is we want to get input from the public as much as we can um, because the attorney, town attorney is going to be drafting potential ordinances over the summer uh, that will come back to us in the fall. Uh, just so you'll know, um, I'm still not sure what the heck the state's doing. I don't know if, I mean, I shouldn't say this, I know. Anyway, they're still working on rules up there also. So it's sort of a moving pieces, but we at least want to get public input. So 4 o'clock tomorrow in the B, the other side of this room. Great, thank you. Councilor Foley. Uh, yes, so ordinance meets tomorrow. I'll be there with bells on. Um, I do hope to have maybe perhaps an opportunity to expand that conversation a little bit, and I, I'll explain a little bit more about that in, in my council member comments uh, based on a phone call I had today. I wanted to mention the cable TV uh, committee um, canceled their meeting this week, and really the, 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 that particular committee has been really struggling with their charge. Mm -hmm. and direction and I've had multiple conversations with um, Todd Souza uh, and some of the other members and so we're going to try to reconvene offline over the next couple of weeks and um, see how we can kind of pick up those pieces and get things moving in the right direction again. So um, I do think there's some work to be done there but um, and we have communications roundtable coming up. Yep. I'll let Councilor Johnson, I don't want to steal his thunder, I'll let him speak to that, and that's all I have for now. Thank you, Councilor Johnson. Uh, yeah, uh, the 25th, Tuesday the 25th, so next Tuesday the 25th at 6.30, we will be at Blue Point School, I believe. Uh, so Tuesday the 25th, 6.30, as a reminder, these are quarterly meetings that are completely open door meetings. There are three members of the Town Council, three members of the Board of Education. Uh, we sit around a table and we discuss anything and everything that is on your mind. Um, I call on new Councillor Cloutier to attend as well. See, I volunteered about for something. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Perfect. So there'll be three or four councillors there, or just three, because we don't And snacks. Four. Yep, and there will be snacks. Uh, so again, that's Tuesday, June 25th, 630 at Blue Point School. Thank you, Councillor Cloutier. Guess not. I, yes. Thank happy to be here. Yeah, happy to, and happy, <laughs> and happy to have you. Happy to have you. Uh, uh, I've got an, a kind of an odd duck combination of uh, committee reports. Metro Regional Coalition, oh. which is the seven communities that surround Portland and uh, uh, do planning on uh, issues like affordable housing, homelessness, uh, uh, opioid addiction, uh, to be able to uh, fire uh, prevention and do it on a regional basis. <clears throat> they held an emergency meeting, uh, uh, I guess yesterday. Uh, this morning. This morning. Uh, uh, on the immigration circumstances that have uh, uh, now become so prominent in the newspaper. Uh, we had the city of Portland, we very well attended, everyone uh, from the seven communities, uh, the town managers, city managers, town council uh, representatives were present. Uh, and the goal was uh, uh, the Metro Regional Coalition staff is uh, a very capable staff and uh, they had arranged to have John Jennings, the city manager, present the situation as he now has it before him. Uh, I reported all of this out to the town council earlier today uh, and welcomed the opportunity to let the public know that uh, the town manager uh, and uh, Christine Egan, the executive director, uh, both felt it was appropriate for us to express support for the, uh, to the city of Portland, and thus uh, this meeting uh, uh, was quickly put together. Uh, we were told by the city manager for the city of Portland that they have been able to stabilize the situation. They've got just over 200 people sleeping on cots in, at the expo. Uh, uh, the uh, soup kitchen, uh, Preble Street, is providing food. They've had a tremendous outpouring of support from the 
community, not only in Portland, but in greater Portland and throughout Maine and throughout the country. Uh, they've raised $350,000 in donations. Uh, all of the service providers who you would think could help have stepped up. Uh, Mercy Hospital, uh, Maine Med, uh, providing all the blankets, sheets, towels, so that these people have, you know, uh, uh, some real ability to have a place uh, uh, to sleep each night. Um, they do not expect <clears throat> to have another wave anytime soon. There was a concern that this might be just the first wave, but based on information that uh, John Jennings told us, uh, the federal authorities who monitor uh, the progress of immigrants uh, moving across South America and Central America and Mexico do not see this. Uh, so that the issue for uh, these towns was presented very squarely by Mr. Jennings. They need the housing to get these people off cots uh, uh, as they're presently uh, sleeping. And these are all families. It's about 102 families, so we need about 100 residences that we need to find for them. Uh, the temporary housing offered by University of Southern Maine in Gorham, a dormitory, is good till uh, early May. Bowdoin College early offered August. Uh, early August. Early August. Uh, Bowdoin College offered uh, 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 a, a similar contribution. Uh, also, mid-August is when the kids come back and they need the dorms back. So that it provides some temporary ability to get these people into a, a respectable setting, but we need to be able to find uh, 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 better housing for them. Uh, uh, the, uh, I really enjoy Belinda Ray, the counselor who sits on the Metro Regional Coalition. And in the course of it, she said, and please do not forget the 500 homeless people that we have every night in uh, the, in the homeless shelters. Huh. Uh, and the 50 people, 40 to 50 people, who are hopelessly homeless on the list, who have no chance with mental illness and uh, difficulties from, from their lives. So uh, uh, we are going to get a list of uh, uh, places that, for which contributions could be made. We will publicize that, that list. The town council will deliberate itself on what further response it can do beyond the town manager's effort to uh, uh, reach out to uh, landlords, developers, uh, and anybody else who may be able to uh, provide some support. Uh, there's a real uh, vetting process problem. Portland wasn't set up to deal with this. They, they have an emergency preparedness plan, which from a communications point of view, they invoked, and that's helped. Uh, but uh, uh, when you are suddenly put in charge of several hundred people who do not speak our language, have different customs and practices, you have to be very protective of them. Their experiences have been terrible. Uh, they've had both emotional and physical abuse. Uh, so uh, uh, it's not easy to just say, oh, well, put put them over here and put, put some over here and you can adopt a family and all that. There's a, there's a serious vetting process that the city of Portland uh, uh, is now trying to tackle. Uh, and it's an interesting aspect of this, but it's the kind of responsibility that uh, uh, we admire from our sister city. So uh, that, uh, the, the second odd item was uh, a GP cog and uh, inherited and merged with PACS, the Transportation Regional Organization, uh, uh, and is really putting a spark into regional planning. We all spent the day uh, experiencing the various transportation modes of transportation, public transportation, uh, starting out at the SACO Transportation Center. And seven teams of four people each then went off, and uh, one went to uh, the train to Portland, and then the bus from the Portland Transportation Center to the docks, and then the ferry to Peaks <laughs> and back. Uh, I was on a team with a couple of people who were very involved with the transportation systems in the Sacco, uh, Old Orchard Beach, uh, Bitterford area. 
And so we, we did that kind of route. We did a, a, a train ride, a bus ride, uh, through, all through Old Urchin Beach uh, and Saco, and then uh, some kind of carriage ride that <coughs> runs seasonally through Kennebunk, Kennebunk Port uh, and Wells. And so it, it, it introduced me to some of the deficiencies in our public transportation system uh, here in uh, Scarborough. <coughs> but I know that in talking with uh, Larissa uh, Crockett, <coughs> she's on it. She's, she's been working behind the scenes, and I was not even aware of it, uh, on promoting public transportation for Scarborough. And she's now sitting on the Saco Uldurji <coughs> Beach, uh, and I'm not sure what the name of that, is that the Breeze, or is that no, the Metro? The, the shuttle bus. Shuttle bus, Zoom. called the Zoom. 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 Uh, so uh, I was very pleased to hear <coughs> that at least somebody in town was way ahead of me, because I felt like I, I knew nothing about it. Uh, the, uh, what was the third one? Uh, uh, the ad, we, we sort of have this ad hoc committee that just came together out of interest uh, on the uh, sports community center. Uh, Paul, Katie, and myself all had an interest in this. And uh, we are going to, with uh, uh, the director for community services, go and uh, visit. We've already visited the Wellesley site that Edge Sports is in the process of just completing. Uh, we have three or four more YMCAs up the coast, Freeport, uh, uh, Wiscasset, uh, Booth Bay, uh, and Bath that we're going to visit because we're really trying to understand the model that this town would be able to deliver to its citizens if we entered into a public-private partnership. It might be a lease, an anchor lease, but we want to know what the way in which it should be best configured so that people would feel welcomed. Uh, it would have senior citizen components that would be really responsive to the needs of our seniors. Uh, and so we're working at it. And we're going to do that uh, in a couple of days, uh, uh, that trip. So looking forward to reporting that to the community uh, more and more in the future. Town manager report. Yes, uh, a few quick items just to take off on. Councillor uh, Donovan's points. I, I was certainly pleased to be part of that conversation this morning, learning more about the whole uh, asylum seekers and, the, and the, the real challenges that not only they face, but all the regulations and, and uh, surrounding them. Um, it certainly restored my faith in, in humanity a bit uh, in terms of the response, and, and I'm proud of my <coughs> colleagues in the profession, how resilient and responsive they've been. So it was, uh, it was uplifting in that regard. Um, I'm committed to understanding more and perhaps finding ways that uh, Scarborough can contribute to that cause. And I'm pleased to report that uh, in coming weeks. I want to give an update on the, the ongoing illegal dumping down here at the main mm -hmm. veterans home. We have uh, the so-called server, server bullets. We've done a number of things you might have noticed. We've uh, <coughs> modified the, the, the whole station, if you will. We now have a total of four roll-up dumpsters, so we have more capacity to handle volume. We've also removed much of the uh, protective fencing. Uh, we thought you know, it served a very important screening purpose historically, but we also realized that it uh, allowed for all sorts of clandestine activities. Um, <laughs> in spite of those improvements, we still have problems. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we will be doing additional signage. Uh, we have made arrangements for 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week video monitoring. Uh, mm -hmm. These are... Um, motion detected, so mm -hmm. it, it doesn't take someone uh, hours at end uh, to, to research a video. And uh, we're even considering prosecuting, uh, if we have to, given the more egregious of violations. Um, nothing else seems to de de deter the behavior. Uh, and as we've talked uh, uh, previously, this is now starting to cost us serious money in terms of contaminated loads and, and such. So we'll continue to keep you updated, uh, and we'll be using social media to get the word out. We want to get notice out before we take any aggressive action like that, but we really feel as though we need to take the next step. Uh, regarding the public safety building, we are reaching a milestone, so to speak. The, there will be a topping off ceremony. That's kind of a, a ceremonial uh, placement of a final piece of metal. Mm. That will occur this Friday. It's, uh, 
it's really a, a, a celebration for the workers themselves. Um, you might have noticed on past construction projects, there's also a ceremonial fir or ever, evergreen that's affixed at the highest point of the steel structure. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that signifies, but that's part of the ceremony. Uh, perhaps I'll learn more and I'll report back at your next meeting. I also want to draw upon the resources and expertise of Councillors uh, Katarina and Foley. Um, we continue to be challenged in terms of selling the existing building, and I'm starting to get a bit anxious, frankly, <laughs> since we've signed contracts and committed, uh, committed to pay funds, uh, due in part, uh, or based in part on sale proceeds. So uh, there's, there's a long history in terms of <clears throat> interest that's been shown. It's kind of changed over time, and I'd be interested if you're willing to sit down and um, we can walk through what we've done to date and maybe how we can freshen this up uh, going forward. And lastly, I just want to congratulate kind of the community in general, but in particular uh, members of council. This Piper Shores uh, matter has been, you know, before this council for over a year has been noted. Um, and it was impressive in terms of uh, uh, the open-mindedness, uh, the willingness to listen to others and to be convinced otherwise. Uh, I, I'll specifically mention Councillor Johnson. He repeatedly in the last couple of weeks said essentially, you know, convince me otherwise. Tell me what I'm missing. And it's that sort of attitude that I think is really healthy and should be congratulated. So job well done. Thank you. Councillor member, uh, comments? We'll start down with John. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Uh, I, I want to say, it, it, so it was just over a week since the election, and I've had the opportunity to either sit down or speak on the phone with almost every council member and to get them to know them better and understand some of the issues that came before us tonight a little deeper. And I, I, I just find that commendable. I, I think um, I'm excited to be part of this team. Um, working for all of our best interests, and uh, it, it's going to be a pleasure. So, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Paul. Yeah, so building off John, first of all, congratulations. I, I shot him an email, and I mean it. You, you earned every vote out there, and, well, your puppy owned about 100 votes, and well played. I love it. So, <laughs> um, but you put a ton of effort into that campaign, and I thought you were incredibly receptive to everybody that approached you, and so job well done. Um, you definitely deserve to be here. The I know the turnout was pretty low, but I think it was pretty low across the state. So, Tony, do you know how comparatively low we were? To, were we? <laughs> since we're still high. Actually, the state predicted 10 percent. And we were at 14 percent, correct? Right. So, I mean, it, it, it might on its face seem a little depressing, <laughs> but I think you know we continue our reputation of having a solid turnout. Uh, I also think that there was a a lot of common ground on this budget process. Uh, you know, some of us, myself included, sometimes get, you know, there's nothing to fight about, so sometimes they get, might get antsy, but I think there was, you know, I found myself agreeing with Mr. Babine from time to time, and, and I think that other people did too, and he found himself agreeing with the, the issues with the bonding, and, the, and I think that that's good. That's a good starting place for a lot of people uh, that have sometimes perceived competing concerns. I think that, at least we had some common ground this time around. Uh, I went for my run last night, a very short run, because I'm woefully out of shape on the Beaverbrook uh, neighborhood, and I couldn't help but notice there was lots of green stickers on the recycling bins, uh, so good job. Uh, to And I've actually had a couple of people uh, ask questions about the recycling program and the audit, the audit process, and I think it's important to realize that I believe these interns are getting paid about $12 an hour, um, and I think um, it's important that the public understand that this is a cost-saving measure. Uh, we are getting uh, crushed on the cost of recycling that we used to make money on. Uh, so this is, um, I know that if you see three to four college students walking um, down the street, you might think that that's $48 an hour of taxpayer money going out the window. But I assure you that on the other end, it's well worth the investment. Uh, and last but not least, the most serious thing on my uh, comments here is you know, uh, Councillor Hamill does claim to be a fiscal conservative from time to time, but the way he gives his money away on the golf course, um, shameful, has, uh, I'm really starting to question his foundation. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that without any details. But uh, It's all an effort to sandbag yeah. for, the, uh, for the Explorer outing. It's, it's just free money. That's all I got to say. So. <laughs> Uh, I do have a few things. Um, so first and foremost, welcome to uh, John Cloutier. Uh, 
And my condolences. I mean, congratulations. Um, no, uh, it was really great to sit down with you today, and I appreciated the time. Um, and I and I think that speaks a lot to who you are and, and what you're going to bring to the council. So, well done. Um, I did want to concerts in the park start next week, I believe. So uh, get your eye on that schedule um, and come on out to the park and enjoy a free concert. There's a great lineup this summer. Um, School is out. Slow down. Be aware. I've just noticed just in the last two days, kids on their bikes, kids on big wheels uh, in the streets, and just being you know mindful of that is always important. Wanted to give a shout out to the piping plovers who are. <laughs> killing it this year. Uh, the numbers are as high as we've seen, um, but they're, they're not at out of that risk category yet because they haven't all fledged. So um, still stay mindful of, of the little cute things out there and uh, do your job. Um, and then two other things, well, two more things. One is I did get a call today. I know a few weeks ago we um, approved all of those special amusement permits. And I had a, a call from a, a citizen I had spoken to in the in years past and uh, had some concerns. So I do hope the Ordinance Committee can at least talk about what our plan of action is going to be to kind of keep a really strong monitor on that over the summer. Um, and he has welcomed any and all of you to his house. Um, and I'll follow up with you individually on that to uh, see if you'd like to join me on another field trip there, because I think it would be enlightening. And last but not least, I can't let Councilor Johnson be the only jokester in the crowd. I have a great piece of um, town council trivia. We are now the only town council in the state of Maine that has two councilors who own a gray African, African, uh, African gray, gray. parrots. That's parrots. Great. So as I inherited a parrot. Probably in the United parrots. States. Probably, in, exactly. So that puts us on the map and something, uh, Jean Marie, I'm looking forward to uh, giving me some <laughs> Um, words of advice because I never owned a bird, never wanted a bird, and now I have a bird. So, very cool bird. He's cool. So, thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Councilor Gettery. Um, I just wanted to thank our legislative delegation. Um, we got an increase in municipal revenue sharing funds. Mm -hmm. Um, I, if I read it right, uh, that's what I was doing. I was trying to find out what the final numbers were, but it's an increase to 3% and then 4%. So, but Tom's, I'm not. I think it's 3% and 3.75 as well. Okay, all right, okay. Because I was looking at a press release and I'm thinking that didn't look right to me, but whatever. It's more money. And that equates to about $220,000 more in, in revenue than we expected. For this? For this current year. And then the following year will be another, whatever, half percent, three quarters, whatever. that, 110000 Yeah, so anyway. That's nice. Um, so we need to put it to good use um, in helping keeping our taxes stable. So um, that's it. So thank you to the legislative delegation. Thank you. Done. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say uh, great job by, uh, by Jay Chase and uh, Karen Martin this evening on the growth. Uh, uh, that was a uh, real eye-opener. I know a lot of people were asking questions about growth permits. I think they they uh, nailed that head on, and I'll be looking forward to uh, continuing that work in the Finance Committee and working with them on that, but that was uh, really well done. Um, Piper, clearly a win. I'm still astounded by uh, Councillor Johnson's about face at the last minute, but uh, it, I think... Uh, uh, that said, I'm still astounded at how shamefully he takes advantage of people learning new games. You know? <laughs> so he promised to teach me, uh, uh, you know, another game, a card game, which I refuse to, uh, to participate in. Uh, but, but I thought that we uh, we hit this point earlier. I think they we have a, a little bit of a, I think an atmosphere now on the council where we have done a good job of eradicating preconceptions and trying to set aside. Some you know assumptions of what people think and and really believe, and I think we've taken the time, really the time to invest and understand the perspective of someone from their point of view, and then see if whatever common ground there is. And I think we did that as well with the, with the various factions around Piper. Uh, we talked about that. I think that's very promising in terms of how I think we will be able to manage tough issues ahead. Uh, and we have a bunch of them 
uh, marijuana ordinances, and the list goes on and on. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and actually say the uh, Scarborough Land Trust proposal. Uh, that could very well be the first thing that I think most people in Pine Point would agree with. I don't know, can I really, <laughs> that's going to go way out on a limb. <laughs> can't agree on the day of the week or the weather, but <clears throat> I, I think that might be possible. And I, I, another thing about Pine Point I want to talk, we, we've spent some time, uh, you know, the, I've gone down and, and Councillor Johnson joined me uh, and we've walked the parking lot down there and I saw the work that's been done. I think it looks awesome so far. I know there's, there's more work to be done, but I have heard some very encouraging things about what the, uh, the new owners have done in terms of encouraging folks that said they would never sell to them, you know, clamors who said they would never sell to them, who are now happily selling their catch right out of their boat right there and getting a great price for it. So I haven't had a chance to tell everybody about that. And, uh, some of my relatives, uh, close and far, will be giving me a hard time for saying this, but I, I see this as a very positive thing and uh, a really nice gesture uh, by the new owners who, who are doing exactly what they said. They're trying to create a market and really make this a success for all. So um, that I'm very encouraged. So uh, looking forward to the work ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, certainly, uh, we hope the Bailey family with the fire that they had uh, are able to recover quickly uh, and it won't disrupt their season. Timing is terrible. Um, uh, Scarborough High School sports season uh, is just wrapping up and it was a terrific season. Uh, I want to uh, shout out to the boys outdoor track state champs. Uh, girls softball is just a juggernaut, uh, undefeated uh, state champs, 60 straight wins. Baseball, boys baseball state champs, uh, and the girls tennis team beat Falmouth, which had an enormously long record in the Southern Maine state championship part of it. And I was particularly excited when I read the article in the paper <clears throat> that uh, my neighbor, uh, Maine Wire, uh, was, uh, led the doubles team that won the uh, defeated Falmouth to win that uh, that match. So uh, she lives right down there in uh, Higgins Beach with me. So wanted to give her a shout out. Uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, uh, applaud was the Higgins Beach Inn, a real iconic element of Higgins Beach, uh, has now new members of uh, uh, ownership for the last couple of years, a MIGIS group, M-I-G-I-S. Uh, and they have... Uh, been doing a neighborhood picnic at the beginning of the season where the turnout is tremendous. Uh, free drinks and wine and beer and run of the facility for the evening and music, uh, burgers and, and what uh, just a great picnic and uh, a terrific turnout and I really applaud them. They're, they're really becoming a, a terrific member of our, uh, our little community down there. With that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Second. All in favor. We are adjourned. Sure you didn't post that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just I just heard a couple days ago. You know, I, I, I thought I had a chance, but then you'll get used to your chance. You never know. Who wants to go? I heard Katie was Cody